evening, everyone. Uh, I'm calling this meeting to order on Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, night 11 of annual town meeting. Uh, so let's close voting here on the attendance check-in. As always, this is just a test vote. So no worries if you weren't able to get your vote in in time. It's just a way of checking that the voting system is working. And then when we're, when we're done cycling through, so you can verify if your voting was actually working. Uh, after that, we will uh, uh, we'll, uh, do the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, Mr. Hamlet. Let's see. So before we get started, I want to make some brief opening remarks. Uh, first, I've discussed with the chair of the Finance Committee, Mr. Foskett, that we'll take Article 49 out of order to ratify the collective bargaining agreement that's been reached. The deputy town manager will introduce the article and the agreement later in the evening, sometime after the mid-meeting break when we're between articles. Second, I wanna stress the importance of civility as we take up Article 38 tonight. And I wanna briefly discuss the debate during Article 11 about domestic partnerships to make this point. Some of the individuals involved in that debate contacted me afterwards to share their concern that the term fear-mongering was an unfair accusation used against them. I've since watched the video of, of that debate from May 2nd, and I agree that the term fear-mongering was used not just in general, but was directed at the intentions of supporters of the Moore Amendment specifically. And I regret that I didn't catch that at the time. And I apologize to Mr. Moore, Ms. Mann, and Ms. Stamps for my failure to hold the line on civility that night. Going forward, and especially during the debate on Article 38 tonight, I will step in as needed if anyone crosses the line in casting aspersions on the intentions of others, especially those engaged in the debate. Next, uh, let's discuss the swearing in. Uh, any town meeting members who've managed to um, uh, not take the oath of office, office at this point, uh, please check in with Ms. Brazil, uh, the town clerk. I now recognize the chair of the select board, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Moderator, it is moved that if all business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, then when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, June 6th, 2022 at 8 p.m. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Diggins. Uh, that Second. We don't, if we don't finish tonight, then we will. Uh, second. Yep, and we, we will reconvene uh, Monday, June 6th, and we have a second from Mr. Foskett. Uh, let's enable raise hands in Zoom, and if there's any objections to that motion uh, to reconvene Monday, June 6th, if we don't finish tonight, uh, you can raise your hands now to object. 
I see one objection. So it is a nearly unanimous vote, or actually it looks like that hand is lowered. So let's cons I'll consider, oh, there's one hand back. So it's an overwhelmingly uh, positive vote uh, in favor of that amendment, so we, or that, that motion, so we will reconvene uh, next Monday, June 6th. Um, now with raised hands in Zoom, uh, do we have any uh, announcements or resolutions that anyone wants to share? Can you, you can raise your hand in Zoom now if you have an announcement or resolution to share. Okay, seeing none, uh, I now call for reports that are ready to be received. Uh, Mr. Foskett? Mr. Moderator, Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. We move that Article 3 be removed from the table. Okay, we have a motion to move Article 3 from the table. We have a second from Ms. Brazil. Uh, and raised hands in Zoom if there are any objections to taking uh, Article 3 from the table so we can receive reports from committees. Seeing no objections, uh, the motion passes and now uh, we have Article 3 in front of us. Um, so through raised hands in Zoom, does, that, does anyone, um, do any committees have any uh, reports uh, to be received by town meeting? You can raise your hand now. Okay, seeing, seeing no hands, um, Mr. Foskett? Mr. Moderator, Charles Foskett, Sink 10, I move that the that article be laid upon the table. Okay. Second. We have a motion to lay Article 3 upon the table. We have a second from Ms. Brazil. Uh, any raised hands in Zoom for any objections to laying Article 3 back upon the table uh, until next time? Okay, seeing no objections, Article 3 is back on the table. And we now have Article 37 before us where we left off uh, last Wednesday. Um, and so we, let's see, can we bring up the, can we bring up Article 37 and bring the speaking cue back? And given the, the messy, unorthodox way that um, we left the meeting on last Wednesday, for which I apologize, and I wrote a letter about that, which I won't uh, belabor here, um, let's see, we do have three points of order. Um, these are dated from May 25th. So why don't we, uh, why don't we bring these folks up, see if there's still a point of order that they intended to raise. Let's bring up, or, or did they just disappear? Uh, points of order just disappeared for me. So I guess those have been cleared. Um, we do have a, so where we left off to, to recap um, without getting into the gory details from last Wednesday, uh, we did have a floor motion from uh, Ms. Mozina, uh, which I uh, uh, did not allow to move forward. Uh, she is, we've since been in contact and uh, Ms. Mozina has uh, a motion uh, that's ready to be shared tonight. So. I do want to bring, usually we would do this at the beginning of debate of an article, but since we're in the middle of it and we do have this, this motion, uh, I want, uh, let, let's give Ms. Mozina an opportunity to bring that up. Because this is the second time that she's speaking on this article, the limit is, according to our town bylaws, is five minutes rather than seven minutes, which is what all speakers get the first time around. Uh, so this, is, this will be her second and only appearance uh, uh, and she'll have five minutes. So if we can bring up Ms. Mozina to introduce her amendment and so that we can, and then we'll continue debate from there. If Ms. Mozina is present, uh, can you request to be added to the speaking queue? Um, or, 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 or just go ahead, we don't need to wait for that. Um, I'll just set a timer on my own so we know if, when we've hit five minutes. Uh, Ms. Mazina, are you ready to speak? Yep. Good evening, uh, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Um, uh, so the amendment I made. Precinct, please. Yes, um, Angel Mazina, Precinct 15. Uh, nothing more to add to the amendment than what's written on it. It's pretty clear. I think it's uh, not controversial. It's just basically reflecting the source of the authority here of the building inspector uh, in state law. Um, just clarifies that that we're not just creating this out of thin air. Um, and can we can we bring that up? Can we display that so everyone can see? Thank you. Yep. And uh, if anyone has any questions for Ms. Mazina, of course she can speak again. Uh, she just can't request to be on the speaking queue again. That's all. Um, yep. So th this is the. Um, and so Ms. Mazina, you'll actually have to uh, make the motion. 
I move to amend Article 37. Okay, do we have any seconds? Okay, we have a second from Mr. Siano. Um, and so uh, this, the, this amendment, the, the Mazina amendment that we're seeing uh, before us right now is now under consideration under Article 37. Um, so this is a motion to amend the main motion. Anything else, Ms. Mazina, before we move on? That's all, thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, so let's now go back to the speaking queue and we have Mr. Rosenthal next. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Name and precinct. Mark Rosenthal, precinct 14. Um, let's see. So I had a question about uh, this article, uh, which is, does this specify penalties if uh, the wrong party just determines that a, that a structure is unsafe, or does it just specify that inspectional services is the only party that has uh, responsibility for making that determination or what? Uh, let's see, do we have Mr. Klein with us who might be able to answer that? Or anyone on the panel might be able to answer that, feel free to raise your hand. And... Uh, Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Uh, Mr. Moderator, this, does, this particular section does not um, institute any kind of um, penalties. Essentially what would happen um, if, a, if, if somebody else was to determine that uh, said structure was unsound, um, if they then follow through with the building inspector, that's fine. If they were to demolish it on their own, um, then that creates a, a similar situation to um, situations that have occurred before in town. And uh, there would need to uh, seek a process through the Zoning Board of Appeals to uh, try to uh, regain their development rights on the property. Um, and I would ask that if possible, if, um, if Mr. Champ is available to uh, further clarify that point. Uh, do we have Mr. Champa with us? Yeah, I see him in the Zoom. Yep. Where's Tahini? Uh, can everyone on the panel mute who's not actual, actively speaking? Um, okay. Thank uh, you, Mr. Moderator. Mike yeah. Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Uh, so I, I think that the, there's a, a little confusion here in, in that uh, what Mr. Klein is. is has, has basically said is that it, it, the, the reason that it's important that this be in the bylaw is that um, obviously if a, if a home is taken down without the permission of the building department, there's, there's fines that are laid out uh, a process through mass general law, but the zoning implications of it are much more extreme because if it's a non-conforming lot, they may not be able to rebuild that house on that lot. Um, it loses all protection as an existing non-conforming structure. Um, so I, I think that's why this is so important that it be in the zoning bylaw. It's not so much that it changes anything about mass general law. D does that um, answer your question, Mr. Rosenthal? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's take uh, Mr. Schlickman next. Name and precinct, please. Paul Schlickman, precinct nine, motion to terminate debate on all items under this article. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate um, on all motions under this article, which is the main motion and the Mazina amendment. Uh, do we have a second? Um, we have a we have a point of order from Mr. Benson. Uh, let's bring up Mr. Benson's point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Eugene Benson, Precinct 10. I'm new to town meeting, so uh, I apologize if this is out of turn, but we had no debate on the um, amendment. At that all. is correct. And so it'll be up to, uh, it'll require a two thirds vote of town meeting uh, to decide whether they wish to uh, uh, terminate debate, um, or uh, if you can't reach the two-thirds threshold to terminate debate, then we'll continue debate. 
Uh, so it's, it's up to town meeting members at this point to decide uh, whether they should go forward or not. Thank you. Um, so yes, we have a, a second from, let's say I just want to check the timestamp, make sure this is not a lingering second from before. Go this back. A, this is a new second from Mr. Siano. Um, and so let's bring up a vote now. Uh, we have another point of order from Ms. Weber. Let's bring that up. Janice Weber, Precinct 21. I want to know what all the noises in the background, glasses and dishes and everything clamoring. Uh, well, I'm not sure I can answer that question, uh, but uh, I will say if anyone on the, there is some background noise that Ms. Weber is referring to uh, that is a bit distracting. So if you're on the panel uh, or if you're in the speaking queue and you've been kind of uh, queued up to be able to unmute your mic, uh, please leave it muted until you've been called on. Thank you. Um, right, so we had a motion to terminate debate to, uh, by Mr. Slickman and a second by Mr. Siano. So let's bring up a vote now on termination of debate. Of Article 37 um, and all matters before it, which is, includes the Mozina Amendment. Okay, and so we're, as usual, we're voting in waves. If you see some yellow highlighted text that you're in wave, in, uh, you're in wave three or you're in the next wave, just sit tight and it'll open up uh, within several seconds. Um, if you're able to vote, please go ahead and vote. And we're voting here on whether to terminate debate on article 37 and the amendment uh, uh, to the main motion. Uh, if you wish to terminate debate, uh, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, vote no. To Mr. Benson's point, uh, if, uh, if for instance, uh, you wanted more debate on the amendment to better understand it, um, uh, this is your chance to vote no. Um, the vote here covers both the main motion and the amendment uh, together. Um, yeah, the votes are coming in pretty fast. We're at 208 right now, 214. So let's just give another 20 seconds until we close voting on termination of debate. 15 seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds until we close voting on termination of debate. Okay, let's close voting. This is a two thirds vote. And the motion passes uh, very close, 153 in the affirmative, 62 in the negative, 71.2%, just over the two thirds threshold. So uh, we're not gonna cycle through all the votes at this point, but we're gonna go on to a, uh, uh, a vote now on the Mazina Amendment. So if you wish to amend the main motion with the Mazina Amendment to add a legal reference to mass general law, um, you can vote yes. And, and while we're uh, waiting for the votes to come in, can we bring up the text of the amendment so folks know what they're voting on? All right, so you can see the underlying text there um, would be added by the Mazina Amendment. If you're in favor of making that addition of that underlying text, uh, to be added to the main motion, then vote yes. If you don't wish to add that reference uh, to state law, then vote no to leave the main motion uh, unamended. And this is a majority vote on whether to amend the main motion.
If you're in favor of the amendment on screen, amending the main motion for Article 37, then vote yes. Um, if you do not wish to amend the main motion, uh, vote no. Oh, actually, I do want to point out there is a, uh, I'll make an administrative change here. I'm just noticing because there was an earlier version of this amendment. And so something that has not been updated uh, in this version is that the text, if you look at the underlying text, by the director of inspectional services or their designee, yep, the highlighted text here, uh, that actually should not be underlined because that's actually not being modified by this version, like the, this final draft of the amendment. That highlighted text appears in the main motion that is not being added by the amendment. There was an earlier revision of this uh, amendment which did modify that text slightly, uh, but uh, it was decided to not move forward with that. So the highlighted text is already part of the main motion by the director of inspectional services or their designee is already baked into the main motion. It's only the underlined text following that. I apologize for us not catching that uh, until now. Uh, so the only text that would be added is as authorized under the provisions of GL uh, uh, chapter 143. Okay, we have a point of order from Mr. Jameson. Let's take that. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Very quickly, is it supposed to be MGL versus GL? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Mr. Heim, does it matter if it's MGL or GL? Doug Heim, Town Council, it does not. Does not okay. So it sounds like you would assume that general law is referring to mass general law, apparently. Okay, so we have, um, okay, so basically all but four votes are in, so let's just wait another 10 seconds since I was, voting was open a long time. I apologize, it takes so long to, to catch and explain that. Correction, five seconds. Okay, let's close voting on the Mazina Amendment. This is a majority vote. And the motion passes, 68%. And we'll, we'll, we'll cycle through the screens here. It's only termination of debate that will we'll skip the, the voting screens. But for any of these uh, votes, including termination of debate, you can always uh, click the view votes button in the portal and you can see the full votes um, uh, for any member, any precinct at any time. Okay, so, so the Mazina amendment is successful, has successfully amended the main motion now. And after we're done cycling through these screens, we'll take take up a vote on the main motion as amended by the Mazina Amendment. I trust that in the records, uh, we can make the administrative change to fix the, the underlining. Okay, so let's bring up the a vote on the main motion. Okay, and this is a two thirds vote on the main motion uh, to update the zoning bylaw uh, with um, uh, to define who may make the determination that a structure is unsafe. And this is as amended by the Mazina amendment. Yeah, someone's asking in the Q and A about like. Uh, is there a call-in number we can use in case, uh, oh, in case we can't uh, speak or be heard on Zoom? Can we put those instructions uh, in the Zoom? And if there's a phone number, maybe I could even recite it to folks. 
Okay, okay that, that should be coming up shortly. Okay, so we're voting on the main motion of Article 37 as amended by the Mazina Amendment. Um, and this, the, the main motion uh, amends the zoning bylaw to define who may make the determination that a structure is unsafe. If you're in favor of the main motion as amended, vote yes. If you do not approve of the, um, the main motion, vote no. And this is a two thirds vote. We're at 214 votes cast. Um, okay, so let's just go another 20 seconds before we close voting. 15 seconds. I'm getting feedback. Uh, it looks mute. Thank you. 10 seconds since we close voting. Still getting feedback. Five seconds. Yeah, let's close voting on Article 37, main motion of Article 37. Actually. And it passes 215 in the affirmative, six in the negative. And uh, we'll just uh, cycle through the screens here. So, uh, Article, uh, the main motion of Article 37 as amended is successful. And after we're done cycling through all the precinct screens uh, with, with the votes, uh, we will go to Article 38. Which is now before us. And we anticipate a, a, um, a lot of interest in discussing Article 38. So let's make sure that we have um, when the article opens that the speaking queue is uh, available for folks to uh, add their names to it. Okay, so let's, uh, let's open up Article 38 now. Okay, so why don't we bring up uh, Ms. Zembury to uh, the chair of the uh, ARB to kick us off on Article 38. I believe there's a video for this. Uh, let's bring up Ms. Zembury. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, however, I believe that the proponent of the article, um, this is not an ARB article. So I believe that the um, Annie LaCourt has a, has a video to introduce this article. Okay. Uh, Ms. Zembury, uh, while you're there, do you want to speak to, I've been doing this for, for other chairs of other reporting boards or committees. Uh, do you have anything to add about the uh, the vote from the A or B on this article? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rachel Zemberry, uh, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Uh, I will just add that the Redevelopment Board uh, voted favorable action three to two uh, for this article. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, bring up Ms. LaCourt to introduce this article. So um, Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15, if someone would simply play the video I submitted um, I believe it will take up all of my time. Okay. And while we're bringing that up, before we bring that up, uh, uh, some folks are saying in the Q&A that they're not able to get in the speaking queue. Uh, I see several speakers in the queue at this point. It's over 30. That's summer. Um, this house. Let's pause that. Um, so well, if, you're, if you're still unable to get into the speaking queue at this point, if it's not opening up for you, Try reloading your uh, your browser window. To, I was saying that too many users connected. I see. So there's some server uh, issues there. Okay. Well, I apologize for those technical issues. Um, so hopefully, folks are able to get in, and uh, I'll do my best to try to bring folks in who have uh, not spoken as much. Um, uh, and so let's play Ms. Lacourt's video now. Thank you. Last summer, this house was torn down and replaced with this house. Article 38 came about because I watched this house go up and decided that after seeing this happen many times, 
it was time for me to do something about the future of the community I love. One of the things I have always loved about Arlington is that it was a community like the one I grew up in. In my hometown, middle managers like my dad lived on the same street as the families of guys like our next door neighbor who worked on the assembly line. Here in Arlington, my kids went to school with kids whose parents were nurses and lawyers and teachers and computer programmers and beauticians and plumbers, among many other occupations. They had friends who could visit their grandparents or family friends by going upstairs or downstairs in the two family houses they lived in. If you had asked me when my kids were little what the character of my community was, I would have told you about these things. I am not a Luddite, and I love that we are becoming a more racially and ethnically diverse community. At the same time, we are losing the economic and generational diversity I believe makes Arlington the place where, despite its flaws, I was proud to raise my kids. Why is this happening? It's happening because there is a regional housing shortage in the greater Boston area. We are an inner ring suburb with great schools and good public transportation. And on the majority of residentially zoned land in town, a detached single family home is the only type of house you're allowed to build. The cost of land makes small homes really expensive. If a small home is in bad shape or outdated and the land cost of the property is higher than the value of the structure, the property is attractive to a builder looking to redevelop it. It's less attractive to a family who can't afford to buy the house and renovate it. Right now, on most of the lots in town, a builder has only one option. Build a single family home and build it as big as needed to maximize profit. Article 38 gives them another option. Instead of building a single family home, they could build something like this. Article 38 is not about affordable housing. Half of a two family in Arlington is never again going to be an affordable option, according to the federal definition. It is about creating a new stock of smaller homes that allow more people to get a start here or long-term residents to downsize and stay in town. It is about filling in the missing middle. I would urge anyone who also wants to see more affordable housing in town to vote yes on articles 39 and 41. Legalizing two-family construction in all of our residential districts is not a radical change. There are already two families in these districts that were built before we outlawed them in 1975. The effect of Article 38 would be incremental over time. Last year, there were approximately 300 single-family homes sold in Arlington. On average, there are 27 teardowns a year. The effect of Article 38 would be for some of those teardowns to result in two-family construction. To choose to build a two-family, it would have to make personal sense for a homeowner or economic sense for a builder. It would also have to make sense on the lot. Given the size restriction in the article, it will not make sense on a very large lot that can't be subdivided. Given the restrictions on non-conforming lots in general, it would have to make sense within the footprint of the current building on the lot. Not all home sales result in teardowns, and not all teardowns are builders building on spec to sell the home. Under Article 38, I believe that gradually neighborhoods will come to have a mix of housing types. This has been the experience in Minneapolis, according to the staff member I talked to in their planning department. Article 38 is not going to solve all of our housing issues. It will add one tool to the toolbox we will use to shape the future of our town. Two family homes are more sustainable than single family homes. If a single family is redeveloped as a two family in Arlington, the home itself is more environmentally efficient per occupant than a single family. A new home in Arlington, close to major job centers with accessible public transportation, is more sustainable than a new home built further from Boston on what is now open land. Because of current building codes, any new construction is going to be more energy efficient than older homes in Arlington that may not be well insulated or have triple pane windows. Article 38 does not make any changes to zoning other than allowing two units in the newly constructed home. All the zoning regulations that protect open space and limit impermeable surface when a new single family home is built still apply. The tree by law has the same requirements whether a builder is building a single family, a two family or a duplex. This is true in the R2 district as well. Our current zoning did not prevent the builder who built the house I showed you from considerably increasing the building footprint in the paved area. 
From an environmental perspective, if a builder is going to tear down a small home and build something new, a two-family or duplex is preferable. Questions have also been raised about the impact on various aspects of the town's infrastructure and capacity. We have had a much higher population in the past, and our infrastructure handled it. Article 38 would not result in so many more housing units that our population will reach or exceed its previous peak. What lies beneath these questions is the idea that we have reached some limit to how many people can live in Arlington, that new residents will only cause deterioration in our quality of life. Given that the population is lower now than in the past, our community can handle growth and welcome new neighbors. This is the question I hope you will ask yourself as we debate this article. Since our community will certainly evolve, what direction do we want that evolution to take? It is true that we will be one of the first communities to make this change if we do it. Certainly, we will be the first in Massachusetts. I think that is who we are. We are leaders, not followers. This is one small step we can take to do our share to increase the supply of housing in the region, bolster regional environmental sustainability, and hang on to the real character of our community, which is created by diverse, the diversity of our neighbors, not the structure of our homes. Okay, that's the end of the video. Uh, we do have a point of order um, from uh, Mr. Weinstein. Before we take that, I just wanna point out that there was a correction to, the correction was already made, but if you're looking at the kind of the print copy or the ARB report, uh, you'll see on page 23 uh, that footnotes have been added by the main motion and therefore should be underlined, um, but they're not underlined in the ARB report. Um, this has been corrected in the annotated warrant, but you might be looking at an outdated copy of that. Um, and so with that, let's uh, take the point of order from Mr. Weinstein, and then we'll introduce the two uh, amendments that have been proposed. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, uh, name and precinct and your point of order. Okay, unmuted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jordan Weinstein, Precinct 21. If this wasn't such an important, at least to me, and I can see by the speaking list, uh, important to many of us, uh, article, I wouldn't even be raising this point of order. However, I'm very disappointed in the way that the system handled the, uh, the attempt of those of us who wanted to speak to speak. I was among the first, I can guarantee it, to press my uh, wanting to speak button as soon as the portal changed to allow it. Yet I ended up uh, uh, cycling through and having to wait about a minute at least to arrive at uh, position number 36. Um, I would like to see us start over again in the selection of speakers and allow some sort of democratic way and uh, justifiable way to, or a uh, legitimate way um, to speak. I think this, uh, had this been done in person at town hall, you would have seen our hands go up. Uh, we wouldn't be dealing with this, but I think the system really uh, dealt many of us a, a curveball here and I, uh, I object to it. Okay, uh, yeah, I appreciate the concern, uh, Mr. Weinstein. Uh, what I will say is this, that the, my, uh, my best guess as to what happened here is that the load on the system from all those operations uh, uh, being submitted in a very short period of time uh, put this over, the server into an overload state, which rejected then any new requests to come in. And people were probably as a result kind of bounced out and waiting uh, at that kind of uh, that server overloaded screen, right? Um, and, and in person, um, it's like, if you compare it to what would happen at town hall, if we started this article at town hall and the 30, 40, 50 people raised their hand all at once, it's not clear that you would actually get a more fair result, right? As the moderator and the clerk are trying to kind of determine like hands and add them to a list uh, in person. Um, and so I think the problem is whether we were in person doing it the traditional way or the way that we're doing it through uh, the portal, which is clearly uh, imperfect and has some technical issues with being overloaded when there's lots of uh, requests being made, whether it's votes or in this case, hands being raised uh, to speak all at the same time. Uh, what I will say is that I will make a concerted effort when we're back in person to try to use other techniques that are more fair 
when we have the equipment and the technology to do so, such as using voting clickers uh, in the hall, which should be able to resolve this issue, hopefully once and for all. But that's not where we're at right now. And I appreciate the frustration. Uh, but again, it's like we're we're probably no worse than what we'd be doing in person with dozens of hands going up uh, physically uh, in the hall at the same time. Thank you. Um, so another point of order from uh, Ms. Leahy. Lori Leahy, Precinct 21. Um, I also experienced the same uh, thing as Jordan, but I would like to ask that you, uh, you've mentioned this several times that you would um, call on both sides to speak if that beca became clear that only one side of the issue is um, being voiced. Right, thank you, thank you for, the, for the point. Uh, yeah, I, I will be tracking, um, a uh, number of speakers for and against as we go through the debate. And if I determine that that's significantly lopsided, uh, then I'll, I will take the time to ask for folks to kind of even that out. And so uh, what I'll likely do um, is uh, ask for raise, like if for instance, we get lots of folks speaking say in favor, just kind of picking a random side, um, and, we, and we need to balance it out with more speakers against, I might ask for raised hands in Zoom for anyone who is on the speaker queue already and wishes to speak uh, and kind of the uh, uh, speak against, if that's the side that we need to, to elevate. And so that's how I plan to proceed with that. We'll, we'll see how well that works in practice. Thank you. Uh, we have another point of order from uh, Mr. Goodsell. Thank you, Mr. Moderators. It's the uh, Ian Goodsell from Precinct 11. Uh, might, might I suggest that maybe to address Mr. Uh, Weinstein's point, um, may, maybe you could go through the list, uh, but just, just pick them at random, uh, pick speakers at random as opposed to uh, going through it in order. That, that, well, might, uh, that, might, that might address his concerns and, and everyone else's concerns sure. as well. well. Well, the last thing I'll say about this is that I believe the system has inadvertently already selected speakers somewhat randomly as a result of the overload situation. So adding a layer of randomness on top of that might give the perception that it's more fair, but in practice is not really going to be any more fair. Uh, Good so, point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's, uh, so before we head to the speaker queue, uh, we still have two amendments to introduce. So let's bring up uh, Mr. Newton um, and we don't have to, well, uh, let's see, we have one more point of order. Uh, from, uh, from Ms. Gruber. So let's take that before we dive into the amendments. Uh, name and precinct, please. Rebecca Gruber, Precinct 10. Um, I'm not sure if this is a point of order, but seeing 50 plus people on the speaker list, could we as a group agree that limiting ourselves to two or three minutes per speaker is much more reasonable than the five to seven minutes people might choose to speak. Um, this number of speakers will take the entire evening as it is with two minutes. That, that's Thank true you. if we exhausted the speaker queue, but um, I, I suspect that before we get to 50, the 54th speaker, uh, we'll probably have a motion to terminate debate. And one of those will, will be uh, we'll, we'll probably be successful before we get through 50 speakers is, 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 is my guess. Um, so I, I think that'll work itself out. Uh, I take your point that like folks, I mean, it, it would be good for folks to, and this is generally true, especially true to Ms. Gruber's point in this particular case, that there's so many pe people wishing to have a voice on this, um, that uh, please do consider self-regulating uh, how long you're speaking to make your point as concisely as possible uh, with this number of speakers, it's really unlikely that we'll get through like a dozen or two dozen speakers and hear really unique new perspectives. Uh, but if you do have unique new perspectives, please share them as succinctly uh, uh, and to the point as possible, uh, to Ms. Gruber's point. Um, I can't enforce that people speak uh, for less than seven minutes because that, that's enshrined in the town bylaws. Um, we would need a suspension of rules to change something like that, which uh, I'm, I'm not going to entertain at this point. Uh, that's something, if we were going to work that out, we should have worked it out in advance. Um, but we're going to go ahead with the current rules. Uh, but with, uh, uh, I, I, I urge folks to, uh, again, self-regulate as much as possible to have a really crisp, concise, non-repetitive debate um, 
you know, so we could have the most informed voting on this uh, at the end of debate. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's bring up Mr. Newton to introduce his amendment. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. I move to amend the recommended vote of the Arlington Redevelopment Board under Article 38 by changing the footnote to two tables as noted in my submission available in the annotated warrant labeled the Newton Amendment. Okay, can we bring up the text of that? And I see we have, so we have a motion by Mr. Newton to introduce uh, his amendment, and we have a second from Ms. Brazil. Um, so we now have the main motion and the Newton Amendment before us. Um, and so anything else you want to add, uh, Mr. Newton, now that we have it up yeah. on screen? Yes, please, okay. Mr. Moderator. Uh, the unamended main motion from the ARB limits the size of each unit to no more than 1,850 square feet of heated living space, which is the limit of the size of a starter home per state standards. The main motion from the ARB says this limit is to be by deed restriction. For those who are unfamiliar, a deed restriction is filed in land court or the registry of deeds and is binding on future owners. If you're a homeowner, you may remember your lawyer doing a title search when you purchased your home, which would have turned up any deed restrictions among other things on your property. Deed restrictions can be used for good things like ensuring that subsidized affordable housing stays affordable housing. They're also used for bad things like prohibiting vegetable gardens and line drying of laundry. In the early part of last century, deed restrictions were even used to prohibit the sale of property to Jews or people of color, including right here in Arlington. The Newton Amendment would enforce the size restriction on new two families in the R0 and R1 zones as part of the normal inspection process, rather than creating a cumbersome and unnecessary deed restriction. These properties would be ineligible for a building permit to add living space for three years, preventing any gaming of the system. After three years, the Newton Amendment would put residents in these starter homes on an equal footing with their neighbors by allowing them the possibility to expand the size of heated living space by finishing a basement or an attic, adding a bedroom. Without the Newton Amendment, the main motion will prohibit families from modifying their home to meet their changing needs. It leaves no possibility really other than moving for families whose circumstances change over time. For example, some of my neighbors have finished additional space after having an additional child or getting a new job which required them to work from home. If their homes had had deed restrictions, such as the ones put in place that would be put in place under Article 38 without passage of the Newton Amendment, those families could not have adapted and quite possibly would have been forced to move out of Arlington. My amendment will ensure that only starter home sized duplexes and two families are built in the R1 and R0 zones, but it helps families in those starter homes to stay in Arlington by allowing them the possibility to modify their homes when their needs change. Lastly, my amendment respects future town meetings. A deed restriction would not change based on any zoning changes made by a future town meeting. For example, if town meeting changed or removed the size threshold in the future, the deed restrictions would remain in effect for any properties built between now and then. The deed restriction holds little upside for our policy goals and real downside for the future owners of any homes created under this article. I hope you will join me in voting yes on the Newton Amendment. I also hope that you will join me yet in voting yes on the main motion. I'll be voting yes because it is a climate win to end up with two modest units in the place where a very large single family would have gone. I'll be voting yes because the individual units of a two family will be less expensive than a large single family. I will be voting yes because I want us to lead our neighboring communities by example, as we do on so many issues. And I'll be voting yes as a small step in unwinding the racist legacy of zoning in our country. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Uh, let's uh, bring up, uh, we have a point of order from Mr. Siano. Let's bring that up. Name and precinct, please. Uh, Mr. Siano, can you unmute? Uh, 
Mr. Siano, if you can hear me, uh, you should be able to unmute at this point. Got it. There you uh, are. So my, my point of order is the last gentleman that spoke. Wait, was name and precinct, please. Uh, forgive me, Frank Siano, precinct 15. The last gentleman that spoke was speaking to his amendment. And I suggest to you, Mr. Moderator, it was unfair for him to comment on the main motion. That's my point of order. Hmm. That's fair. Thank you, Mr. Siano. Um, when introducing uh, an amendment, um, well, that I have been considering that like the proponent's uh, time to speak, uh, I guess, um, yeah, th that is a fair point. When, when we're introducing amendments, uh, let's keep the comments focused uh, on the amendment itself. Thank you. Uh, so with that, let's bring up uh, Ms. Uh, we now have uh, Ms. Nathan uh, raised a point of order. Uh, Michelle Nathan, Precinct 11. Um, I hope I'm new, still new to this, so I hope this is appropriate. I just wanted to make sure that if we vote, say this passes, is it clear then that we're voting for the main amendment or we're just voting for this one and it doesn't impact the main amendment? Thank you. Uh, when you say the main amendment, the, the main motion which seeks to amend the zoning bylaw? Yes, thank you. Right. I mean, it, like there are cases, I mean, just to clarify, um, uh, if the, there may be cases where someone might wish to vote for an amendment, uh, like a motion to amend the main motion, uh, and then vote down the main motion. Like there's, there's, there's not, um, you're not required to uh, vote for the main motion if you voted in support of, uh, of an amendment, if that makes sense. Um, there may be cases which we'll actually cover tonight um, where there can be an incompatible, like a, a logical incompatibility between um, uh, not just a semantic incompatibility, but like a syntactic incompatibility uh, between amendments. And that actually is the case tonight. And I'll, I'll point that out after we've introduced the second amendment. Um, uh, we have another point of order from uh, Ms. Uh, Penarin. Let's uh, bring her up. Uh, good evening, Kristen Penarun, Precinct 20. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm so sorry for taking time on this, but I'd like to go back to the two speakers ago point of order to clarify. Is it really the case that uh, individuals who are speaking to introduce a proposed amendment are limited from speaking in regard to the main amendment? I had understood that they would be able to use the full amount of time that would typically be allotted to speakers. Is that not the case? I would like to understand this better because it's relevant to the discussion we're having now and because it's relevant to the way that town meeting as a whole functions. Right, um, right. Thank you in advance for clarifying. I, I would very much appreciate it. Great, thank you. Um, that's something that, that we haven't actually settled as like a matter of policy um, uh, at, at, at this annual town meeting. Um, um, I, I really would have to have more time to think about what, what the right policy should be going forward. Uh, I take Mr. Siano's point and his point of order uh, that uh, the time should be spent focused on, on the amendment as opposed to advocating this. And the, the rationale for that and the reason why I think it makes sense is, and I just wanna be brief about this because I know a lot of folks are, are, are you know, wanna want speak on the substantive uh, aspects of this, this, this article is that someone is elevated to, ahead of the speaker queue, in this case, ahead of 43 other speakers um, in order to introduce their motion. And when they're given that priority, um, that uh, I think it does make sense for their speaking time to be focused on the amendment that they're bringing forward, uh, irrespective of the virtues uh, potentially of the main motion that it might be in support of. Um, and so if someone did, it, it does seem more fair to me that if someone wished to speak, who is introducing a, a, a motion to amend, um, wish to speak to the, the virtues, for instance, of the main motion, that they can't, they do have an opportunity to get back in the speaking queue like everybody else, um, which then puts them at a disadvantage to talk about that because we've already had over 50 people get in the queue. So I don't think there's any perfectly fair way to handle that. Um, but if we can, if the folks introducing the amendments 
uh, could use their kind of privileged time ahead of the, the speaker queue to try to stay as focused as, as much uh, as they can on the amendment that they're introducing rather than the, the, the virtues or vices of the main motion, uh, that that's where we should try to land. Uh, I'm not gonna set an explicit policy about that, but I think that would be the right thing to happen. And I, I believe Mr. Newton was, was you know, pretty well within those parameters as he only mentioned fairly briefly uh, uh, his support of the main motion. So thank you. Hopefully that clarifies a bit. It, 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 we haven't really fully nailed that down, but I, don't, I, I also don't wanna spend a lot of time nailing that down uh, right now in the middle of the meeting. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's uh, bring up uh, Ms. Babiars now uh, to introduce uh, her amendment as well. And if we can get that up on screen as Ms. Babiars is speaking. Uh, name and precinct, please. Josephine Babiars, Precinct 15. And thank you, Mr. Moderator, for this opportunity to present this amendment. Um, first, I would like to just say in response to two comments made by the earlier speakers, that a discussion of this article in its own is not discrimin discriminatory against any group. Um, I have five questions about Article 38, and I'd like to address them. The first is, is this article actually feasible? Secondly, will the town retain its own zoning codes for quality, as some speakers hope it will? Third, who is going to be in charge of this enforcement of the deed? Fourth, there are some legal issues raising their heads here, whether or not this is a taking. And fifth, will this amendment produce the benefits that the town wants? I'd like to thank both town council, town clerk, Brazil, and you, Mr. Moderator, because you have worked with me over three separate amendments um, my entire goal was to try and delay this. And I think administratively, we will come up to some answer about how that is to be done with all of the interest, intricacies of the zoning. My first point, is it feasible? The Home Advantage Team website known to folks in the town says that in 2020, a single family went for 1,069,000, a two family, the average was 1,168. So if someone were to renovate a single family into a two family, you'd have about $100,000, give or take, to play, to play with. If your house was built in the 1950s, you probably have asbestos. We did. You probably have lead paint if you painted since, the 19, since before 1973. More feasible and allowed under the guidance that we're talking about here is a four family. A four family at 1850 square feet, the cost would be roughly 1 million eight and each unit would sell at 712. So in contrast with some of the Minneapolis affordable housing that goes for 299, we're at least in a market where we won't find single families likely at the 712 price point. What about new growth? Because that has been raised. If a single family is valued at 1.0 million and the two family at 1.2, the new growth is really limited to 200,000. Uh, uh, this not be ours. Let me let me just interrupt to say yeah. that. Uh, so this, I, I I see where you're going with this, since I, I know the, the nature of your your amendment. Um, it's a pretty long wind up, uh, to be honest, uh, for the delay that you're looking for um, in this taking effect. And so I think a lot of the points that you're covering, I'm confident, will be brought out in debate by folks who can dig more deeply into those those points, which I think warrant. Uh, kind of deeper discussion, but as far as like the like the presentation of this amendment, uh, uh, I, I think I think the meeting at least I would appreciate. I think the meeting would appreciate uh, coming to the point uh, a bit more sharply. All right. Well, we'll move on to the draft guidance. Yep. Okay. And the draft guidance will allow multifamily housing as of right, and it will control any other zoning or bylaw passed by the town except for those dealing with public safety and convenience. So this means the current setbacks, FAR, height restrictions, tree protection, and everything that Arlington enjoys are void 
if we don't meet that requirement. The guidance at five, and again, I admit this is a draft guidance and hasn't gone very far, but if you're looking to tie into the funding provided by the state, this is what you have to confront. Determining a reasonable size, multi, minimum multifamily unit capacity says basically if you don't hit the minimums, you are going to be faced with whatever the state and the MBTA community decides you must do. So let's go then. So what I'm trying to say there is the law may not be with you and allowing you to go with a single family, two family, 1850 square foot. It may be forcing you into a larger type of redevelopment that would be more appropriate for Mass Ave. Third point, who is going to enforce this provision? It has to be in the deed. And as far as I know, the only town official who's involved with the sale of a property is the fire department. So I can't imagine that the fire chief would be interested in looking at the deeds, but it has to be done if it's going to happen. As another speaker mentioned, this is done by deed either in the land court or in the Massachusetts Registry of Deeds. And so now you have the problem of what happens if the seller doesn't put it in and it's not in the deed? Do we penalize the buyer? Do we penalize the seller who has taken the money and presumably gone somewhere else? Um, do we expect that we're going to have town, we're going to pay town people to go to the different registries and track all this down? It's not clear how this is going to work or how it's going to be enforced. And I would suspect that people could come up with workarounds. If you put it in the deed, this is my fourth point. If you put it in the deed, you now have a taking that can be compensable under- Ms. Barbie, I just want to point out, you, you are at the six minute mark. So you yep. will need to wind up your remarks. Yeah. So and, and you need to actually move the amendment or else we'll have nothing to actually vote on. All right, so I need, so it could be a taking that could cost the town money. And then lastly, we don't really know what's going to happen with it. So at this point, I would like to move the amendment and ask the town to seriously consider this amendment. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a motion before us. Uh, before we take uh, any seconds, do, we do have a point of order uh, from Ms. Elliott. Let's take that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Beth Elliott, Precinct 10. Um, I appreciate your patience, but I, I believe that entire presentation was on the merits of the main motion. Um, and if we are going to have rules that prohibit people from introducing amendments and using them to speak on the merits, I would appreciate if they were administered equitably. Thank you. Thank you. I guess my, my interpretation that I'm taking is that it was a very long windup, um, uh, in, in my opinion, excessively long, but I mean, the, the speaker did have that time uh, allowed to them. Um, it was a, a wind up for, I believe, expressing uh, why a delay would be needed for this to take effect. Um, um, okay, so we have uh, a motion to uh, put forward the Babiar's amendment, and we have a second from uh, Ms. Desmond. So we now have uh, Babiar's amendment in front of us as well as the Newton amendment. Um, so uh, I do want to actually, before we get back into um, uh, the, their, the point of order from Ms. Penron, I believe I saw in the Q and A that um, I believe she was saying that she may have been prematurely muted. Can we bring up Ms. Penron? Um, did we cut off her remarks? That was not my intention. Mr. Moderator, thank you very much, Kristen Penron, Precinct Twenty. I, I do think the remarks might have been cut off. I was just trying to ask you some intelligent questions about the way that. This article and its proposed amendments are being moderated. I think several speakers have shared similar concerns and I would like to have a very, I would like very much to have a fair and unbiased discussion about this. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's, uh, uh, okay, we have a second request. I'm not sure what that's in reference to, uh, but uh, we already have the two amendments in front of us. Uh, so let's now go to the uh, speaking queue. Let's uh, take it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bagnell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Alex Bagnell, Precinct 9. 
Uh, Ms. Babiara has raised the possibility of this article being a taking. Uh, could we get a legal opinion on that? Whether it's a taking or what a taking qualifies as? Whether or not it would constitute a taking. Uh, article 38. Uh, Mr. Heim, do you have any uh, interpretation on whether Article 39 or 38 is uh, is a taking? Doug Heim, Town Council. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, Town Meeting. Uh, I'm not sure what context in which what what, what uh, the amendment mean or the uh, previous speaker means by taking. Usually, when we're talking about a taking, you're talking about the government um, imposing some kind of either directly saying. We're taking your property and we'll compensate you for it. Sometimes there's something called a constructive taking. I don't think that a zoning bylaw amendment that allowed for uh, two family homes where there were previously single family homes would constitute a constructive taking. Um, and even a deed restriction to um, limit the growth of, I'm sorry, the size of a property uh, I don't see that as a taking, um, constructive or otherwise. I understand the overall argument, perhaps analogy, but I, I don't think the town would face significant liability as a taking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there have been some discussions of this article's equity considerations. Uh, what role might the passing of this article play in the town's equity goals and or our upcoming equity audit? Um, let's see, uh, let, let, let's, uh, let's try, uh, Ms. Zemberry, do you, have, do you have an answer for that? Uh, Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Uh, I believe that the appropriate person to answer that would be, um, the, uh, the town manager. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Um, I don't mean to uh, doubly pass the, the rostrum, but I think we have our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Jillian Harvey here, who probably could most directly speak to that question. Okay, is, uh, is Ms. Harvey here who can answer that? Yep. She is. Hi. Uh, name and, uh, and title, please. Uh, Jillian Harvey, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division. Um, and just to confirm, Alex, you were asking about um, how this would impact the equity audit or the yes. role that it, okay. um, so we're actually just in the process of starting that and housing is going to be one of our main focuses. Um, I know that for me, I'd see that this um, amendment, you know, allowing two family homes in a single family in single family zones by right, it's a very small but realistic actionable step um, that could help the town work towards some of the recommendations that were laid out in the Fair Housing Action Plan that was released last, last summer. And that's something that um, is also being provided to our consulting group that we're working with on the audit. Um, along with that, they'll be doing their own work out in the community to assess folks needs, their perceptions about housing and how it impacts the town. Um, and I think just to speak a little bit to the history of you know, zoning and its relation to DEI, um, Arlington is just like every other community in the greater Boston area. And it's not exempt from uh, benefiting from historically discriminatory housing practices and land use policies, which have had pretty lasting effects that are evident and clear today. Um, and the, the amendments and the bylaw that you know, we've had for the last, I'd say, three to five decades, whether intentional or not, um, does restrict growth and development in town. And so that's something that throughout this audit we'll also be looking at um, because these types of policies are rooted in inequity. And so, you know, for me, a lot of people in Arlington say they value diversity and inclusion um, and believe that Arlington is a welcoming community and they want to see more quote unquote diversity. But the bylaw says otherwise, because it's nearly impossible to allow growth and folks to move into this town um, unless they're in a specific socioeconomic bracket. Um, and so this will be a pretty big focus of the community equity audit that we're getting started. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so to, to piggyback onto that, I would say I would add that, you know, the thing about systemic inequality is also that 
preserving the status quo benefits those of us who have already benefited greatly and continues to marginalize those who have been and are being harmed. Uh, concentrated wealth requires concentrated poverty. Given the history of exclusion and systemic inequality that is baked into single family zoning, I think the right question is not what harm can it do to wait or how might it harm me, but rather how much more harm are we willing to do before we start making any real change? Uh, as Jenny Schultz writes in Fixer Upper, our current housing systems create enormous costs disproportionately borne by vulnerable populations. The interconnectedness of these housing policy systems make it difficult to solve one piece at a time. Rolling back exclusionary zoning across enough localities to improve regional housing production and affordability will require affluent homeowners <clears throat> to accept changes in their neighborhoods. I'd like to conclude with a quote from the color of law. Uh, when we become Americans, we accept not only citizenship's privileges that we did not earn, but also its responsibilities to correct wrongs that we did not commit. It was our government that segregated American neighborhoods, whether we or our ancestors were witness to it. And it is our government that must now craft remedies. That's us folks. We are that government. Please join me in voting for this remedy and for the Newton Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. All right, thank you, Mr. Bagnall. Uh, uh, before we take the, uh, let's see, Actually, let's just go to the, the next speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Rudick. Hi, Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. I had intended to give a presentation describing what life is like in one of these new two-family duplexes and how great they are and how I've had no problems and how energy efficient they are and the neighborhoods they create, et cetera, et cetera but I would instead like to yield my time. We have one of the foremost experts in housing policy as a resident of Arlington, Dr. Catherine Levine Einstein, doctorate from Harvard University and currently serving as associate professor at Boston University. I yield my time to her. And Dr. Einstein is a resident of Arlington, I believe you said? Yes. Okay, yeah. and she has the right, right to speak uh, introduced uh, by a town meeting member, uh, Dr. Einstein. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, then, everyone. Thank you so much um, to all sorry, of you. I'm sorry. Can you, yeah, can you uh, state your name and uh, address? Of for course. Yeah. Yep. So I'm Catherine Einstein. I live at 22 Sutherland Road. Um, I'm a resident of the Heights in Precinct 20. And I'm also a former member of the ARB and the Housing Plan Implementation Committee and a professor of political science at BU. I specialize in local politics and housing policy and have published peer reviewed research on land use politics using data from Massachusetts and elsewhere with my fellow Arlington resident and town meeting member, Max Palmer. Recent research indicates that Article 38 will have a small but positive effect on the housing supply in Arlington and will not substantially change our neighborhoods. We know from academic research that places with more land use regulations, such as single family zoning, have higher levels of racial and economic segregation, and that the production of more market rate multifamily housing is a critical part of addressing housing affordability. Indeed, research in this field has been extraordinarily consistent. This finding has been replicated in multiple studies in urban planning and economics. Building more market rate housing is absolutely critical in high demand metropolitan areas like ours to bring down housing prices. While new construction duplexes are expensive, data from Arlington and elsewhere shows that they are significantly cheaper on average than new construction single family homes. Recent analyses of the states of California and Oregon and the city of Minneapolis, all places that have already implemented a reform exactly like the one proposed in Article 38, suggest that the effects of this article will be quite modest. While new construction of uh, duplexes are expensive, they will be significantly cheaper on average than new construction single family homes. Finally, you'll hear a lot of calls for delay tonight. My research, along with fellow Arlington resident, uh, Max Palmer, shows that delays like these are extraordinarily common, common in housing politics and contribute to explosive increases in housing costs. Doing more studies is always appealing, and to many people, there will never be enough studies to act. But delay can feel like a neutral or compromised option, 
but have a profound and negative impact on our housing market. I encourage town meeting members to support Article 38 and the important first step that it represents for our housing market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rudick, anything else? I would just finally like to say that the views expressed by Dr. Einstein and by the previous speaker are not fringe. They are not rare in Arlington. Um, I am the founder of a group called Arlington Neighbors for More Neighbors that advocates for secure, abundant homes for everyone. We have over 400 members and are overwhelmingly in support of this article. Please join me in voting yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so before we take the next speaker, uh, I just want to point, there was a question in the Q&A about uh, seconds, like did we actually get seconds for the amendment? I did recognize seconds for both amendments. Uh, I thought I verbalized that, but if I didn't, I apologize. We had uh, Ms. Brazil seconded the motion to put forward the Newton Amendment and Ms. Desmond uh, seconded the motion to put forward the Babiars Amendment. Um, so they, they are seconded and uh, in front of us. Uh, let's see, let's take uh, Mix Pretzer next from the speaking queue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, it's David Pretzer, uh, Precinct 17. When I talk to people in Arlington about what their issues are, um, the most common thing I hear is people talking about their concerns about housing costs. Um, housing costs continue increasing and many people uh, are rent burdened or worried about their ability to continue to live in Arlington uh, long term. Uh, many of these people um, aren't eligible for the subsidized affordable housing, which is very limited in supply. Um, it may be because of wait lists, it may be because of income levels, it may be because the subsidized affordable housing is only available to citizens and immigrants who are not yet citizens aren't eligible for it. Um, we can't count on only subsidized affordable housing meeting our housing needs. Article 38 also won't solve all our housing problems, but it's an important positive step, you know, a small step, but a good step towards uh, that, you know, towards addressing these issues. Um, to sort of explain how um, Article 38, you know, creating these uh, new duplexes can sort of help uh, address housing costs at various levels, I want to draw an analogy to used cars. I don't know if any of you have tried to buy a used car recently, but one thing that happened recently is that due to supply chain issues, uh, new cars were not be able to be produced in the levels they normally were. And so many people that would normally be buying a new car instead um, were, you know, ended up buying used cars. And because of this increased demand for used cars, uh, cars that were, you know, three, four, five years old, cars in worse condition were being bid up to prices that were above the list price for new cars. And so people that would never be able to afford a new car that needed a way to get around were suddenly faced with not even being able to find a used car that they could afford. The same thing happens in housing. If we don't build um, housing for uh, people that, you know, the, you know, we don't build housing for people sort of at middle class levels, then they'll build up um, housing that otherwise would be naturally affordable. Um, by, um, the other thing I want uh, people to keep in mind is teardowns are already happening. This article isn't going to cause teardowns to happen. That's not going to happen before. Uh, tear, you know, teardowns are going to happen when homes need to be replaced or when um, when it's you know when a home you know is is outdated and a new home would be economically attractive. What we're choosing here is whether that town teardown leads to a multi-million dollar large detached single family home or it leads to two size limited units that will um, each be su substantially cheaper than uh, than the multi-million dollar single family home that otherwise would have been built here. Um, I think that from my point of view, building the two homes is, is much more attractive. We, we have uh, two family homes in single family areas that predate current zoning and they are an asset to our neighborhoods. More homes like these to replace the, uh, the sort of naturally affordable homes we've already lost to tear downs would just make our neighborhoods stronger. Uh, one last point is uh, it's definitely the case that Arlington would be a leader in, in doing this before other communities, um, but we are also not alone. Uh, our neighbor Lexington, in fact, has in their comprehensive plan um, a, a strategy of, uh, of 
enabling more different types of housing uh, across town, including two family zone homes or, or multifamily homes in areas that are currently uh, single family zoning. So um, they have not done this yet, but this is part of a conversation that's going on elsewhere in the region. This is our opportunity to lead the way and be part of a regional solution that could go beyond our borders. I think Arlington is at a great position to lead the way to creating more homes for people that need them and addressing our housing issues. And I hope you um, join me in supporting the main motion and the Newton Amendment. And I think that for people who are facing um, housing cost burdens, we can't afford to wait any longer than necessary. So I hope that you will not um, see, see I need to delay this any further. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've now had uh, uh, three speakers by my count uh, who've spoken in favor of these three speaking slots, I'm not counting individual speakers uh, who's yielded time. Um, can we enable raise hands and Zoom? Um, and if you want to, if you wish to speak against uh, the main motion uh, and potentially to the amendments as well, but against the main motion, uh, raise your hands and I'll uh, try to balance this out a bit. Uh, so the, um, saw a bunch of hands and they disappeared. Why is that? Okay. Um, so now is a difficult challenge of uh, picking folks who are actually on the speaking queue. Um, I see um, the earliest person I see in the speaking queue who's raised their hands, I think, is uh, Ms. Let's take Ms. Evans. Name and precinct, please. Thank you so much. Winnell Evans, Precinct 14. Um, like many people who have lived here for a long time, I am floored by what's happening to home values, and I'm concerned about how this is changing our town. The middle class town I moved to many years ago is now an affluent suburb. It's increasingly difficult for people without big bankrolls to buy or rent here, and increasingly difficult for those on low or fixed incomes to stay here as property taxes rise along with valuations. The residents who drafted Article 38 acknowledge that it will not solve this problem, but they say it will provide housing choice. This choice will be for those who can afford million dollar plus homes only. What we already see before anything at all has changed is that in every case when a single family in an R2 district is replaced with duplex condos, each new unit sells for several hundred thousand more than the demolished single family and sometimes for close to twice its price with almost all listing at over a million bucks. The economics of replacing single families with duplex condos are obviously very attractive. Article 38 will simply accelerate this process. The demolition of smaller, older, more attainable homes and buyers will now be competing directly with builders for those houses. These older homes may not have great rooms and open floor plans in the latest greatest kitchens and they may require work but that is the very definition of a starter home. And these houses are how I and many others gained a foothold in this town. Minneapolis is one of the four communities in the US that have eliminated single family zoning, effective in December, 2018. 2022 data from the Minneapolis Area Realtors Organization has charted a 28% decline in the affordability index since then. In the 16 counties, that comprise the Twin Cities regional area. What are the factors that are contributing to this? How are they similar to or different from factors that might be in play here? Wouldn't it be a good idea to explore this? The ARB itself stated that it wants to see more robust data-driven information about this article. Article 38 will provide choice for those who can afford million dollar houses at the expense of those who can't. It will put upward pressure on the valuations of nearby homes. It will ultimately make our community less affordable, less diverse, and less inclusive, exactly the goals our housing plans strive to achieve. In fact, two members of the Redevelopment Board voted against this article, citing concerns with its failure to align with Arlington's comprehensive housing strategies. We are meeting the needs of higher income buyers. It's middle and lower income buyers, as well as renters, who are being shut out. We need to focus our resources on furthering the work the town is already doing and planning, supporting our housing corporation, 
our most successful creator of capital A affordable housing, getting the transfer fee passed to fund our affordable housing trust fund, establishing an affirmative fair marketing plan, considering down payment assistance, building alliances with nonprofit developers to create affordable projects, and exploring community land trusts to acquire and maintain older starter homes. I firmly believe that allowing two families by right will only fuel the upward trend in prices and that any size limits will be eliminated as soon as possible. For these reasons, I urge you to join me in voting no on Article 38 and all amendments. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, we're almost at the 9.30 mark. Uh, let's take a, a 10 minute break. Let's come back at, let's make it around uh, uh, a round number. Uh, 940. Let's come back at 940. And uh, I am keeping track of pros and cons and questions being asked because I want to make sure we also have an opportunity to hear folks uh, who simply have questions uh, and want to focus on directing questions at folks who might have answers. Um, so I'll try to uh, keep space for that as well. Uh, so let's come back at 940. Thank you. Okay, it's 940. So let's come back. And I will take uh, at this point two more uh, speakers against uh, the main motion uh, before we go back to um, the kind of randomized uh, speaking queue. Um, and if we need to rebalance again at some point, then we'll we'll do that again. Um, my goal is to like not is, is to have minimal disruption to the flow of debate. So we're not gonna be kind of raising hands all the time, but just to rebalance every so often. Uh, so let's take uh, uh, Ms. Bra uh, Barron next. Uh, Ms. Barron, uh, name and precinct please if you're able to unmute. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sherry Barron, Precinct 7. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead. Mr. Moderator, I rise in opposition to this article. I have a statement to make and then I have a question and I'll keep it as brief as possible. I haven't yet heard or read any convincing argument or benefit that would prompt me to take the step to eliminate single single family zoning in our town. <clears throat> and while I agree with the opponent's positions regarding increased home sizes, shrinking lawn space, loss of trees, drains on scarce resources and increased reliance on town services, my biggest concern is diversity in our town. When my husband and I moved here in 1976, Arlington felt like a small town. There was a wide array of housing available for people of varying income levels. We chose a two family on Highland Avenue for our starter home. And from there we moved to Morningside and finally landed here on Raleigh Street in a standard average size colonial. We had affordable choices. If article 38 passes, Ms. LaCourt suggests we will increase the diversity of our neighbors. If Article 38 passes, we will deliberately and knowingly tighten the circle of who can and cannot live in Arlington. We will become, and we have already are headed there, to be a rich town, one in which young families and individuals in the middle income level won't have the opportunity to share the life that so many of us value. Put plainly, we will price people out. Early into my tenure on the Arlington Human Rights Commission, we crafted a mission statement that includes these words, and I quote, we stress the importance of and our commitment to the ever-changing tapestry of our town, end quote. The change that will occur as a result of the passage of Article 38 will only serve to create a situation where diversity slowly dies and eventually becomes unsustainable. I would hope that the members of town meeting give serious consideration to what kind of town they wanna live in 
and how to keep Arlington a welcoming community to all who want to live here. And I have a question. Um, <clears throat> since 40% of the Arlington Redevelopment Board voted against Article 38, if they are here with us, I know Ms. Zenberry is, and if Ms. Tinta Callis is here as well, would you kindly ask them to explain to town meeting their reasons for their negative votes? Thank you. Sure, uh, Ms. Zenberry, since you're readily available, um, can you speak to your dissenting vote? Rachel Zenberry, chair of the redevelopment board. I'd, I'd be happy to share. Um, so all of the discussion regarding the uh, votes of the Arlington Redevelopment board, board meetings are covered in the report to town meeting by the redevelopment board. Uh, just to hit the highlights, I'll just note that the uh, members who voted uh, against favorable action were in favor of the concept of the article. Um, I personally uh, was concerned about not having seen an engagement plan um, with town members and town meeting members um, as part of the materials that we were able to review um, as we reviewed the article. Um, I also, at the time we uh, had, the redevelopment board had endorsed the housing production plan, but it had not yet been reviewed and endorsed by the select board, which it has um, as of today. Um, and the two members, including myself, who voted against the article, had the hopes that this type of innovative um, article, which we believe, again, will lead to greater housing choice in Arlington, could uh, be creatively uh, partnered with other strategies identified in the housing production plan to create a more comprehensive policy, potentially in the future. Thank you. Ms. Barrett, anything else? Yes, is Ms. Tintacalis present? Uh, I don't, is, uh, is Ms. Tintacalis uh, present or? Uh, this is Rachel Zenberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Uh, Ms. Tintacalis is not present. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thank you, Ms. Zenberry. Great, thank you, Ms. Barron. Um, so let's take one more from folks who had their hands raised. The, the next person I believe I had in order uh, is Mr. Gersh. Let's bring him up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Gersh, Precinct 18. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow town meeting members, whether or not it's a good idea to eliminate single family zoning is debatable and we are debating it here. But what is not debatable is the fact that your constituents, the people that we are elected to represent have no idea what is hanging over their heads in this town meeting. We are discussing no less than the elimination of single family zoning, which has been around far longer than any current resident. It's all they know. How dare we consider dropping this bombshell on our unsuspecting neighbors? The election turnout last time was what, 20%? pitiful, right? But that means for certain that at least 80% of the residents that we represent have no idea that we are talking about eliminating single family zoning. I am willing to debate whether this is a good idea. But what I am not willing to do is pull the rug out from under my good neighbors. Imagine that the first clue that they have about this change is when the house next door to them is replaced by a 5,500 square foot monster, larger than virtually any McMansion 
going up today with two or more families, depending on the ADU situation, there will be a backlash. And now look at the amendment offered by Mr. Newton. We haven't even yet eliminated single family zoning and already attempts are being made to remove the modest safeguards built into Article 38 by the ARB. How dare we? You convince me that rank and file Arlingtonians want this change, the people affected by this change, and I'll play ball. Do your diligence because I am not convinced. These are the people we represent. And delaying implementation until 2023 will make no difference whatsoever. There will still be an inevitable backlash directed at you, but the damage will have already been done. For now, please let me sum this up just as simply as I can. In three words, in fact, forget about it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Gersh. Uh, so we've had three speakers, four and three against now. There were some questions kind of sprinkled in between there, but um, uh, if everyone can lower their hands now in Zoom, I've recorded a, about a dozen people and matched them up to the speaking queue. Um, uh, so I have plenty of, of speakers against to pull from now. Thank you. Uh, so now if we can get any raised hands from folks uh, who may be undecided and have questions. Um, so we can get those questions aired uh, to hopefully help folks uh, make a decision on this. Um, I see uh, Mr. Solomon's at the head of the queue, speaking queue, and he's raised his hand. So you are the obvious next choice, Mr. Solomon. Name and precinct, please. Yes, Joe Solomon, precinct 16. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Terrific. Um, I just had a couple questions. I was reading through the annotated warrant, and I've seen some emails come through when Mr. Gersh brought up a, a point about size. So um i was curious if anybody from the town had any concerns about the impact on the town's infrastructure from passing article 38 uh infrastructure do we have uh mr rademacher present from uh director of public works not sure if uh mr rademacher would be the best yes. person to answer but um, yep. mr rademacher sure michael rademacher director of public works uh, it's a, this is not a very straightforward question because it's not clear the, the number of additional units that would be um, developed or constructed with this, although I would say that the town of Arlington has had um, greater population in the past and our infrastructure was able to um, meet the demand. Uh, that being said, it is a, a more aged infrastructure now and will require us to continue making improvements. Uh, so I think we can handle uh, some limited increase, uh, but without knowing the exact amount, it's tough to say exactly. So it sounds like it's unpredictable since we don't know how many, if this went into effect, how many people would actually take advantage of it. Is that accurate? Correct. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Solomon? Um, yeah, just one other well, question. Is, is anyone, if, if anyone in particular you'd like to direct the questions at, uh, feel free to let me know and I can see if they're available to answer. Yeah, I, I also had a question. There, there's a proposal that there's some way that a building could be built with two of the 1,850 square foot units and two ADUs. I was curious if there was someone from maybe a, a um, you know building inspection or whoever certifies that at, at when it's constructed who could give a little bit more detail on whether or not sure. that would be allowed. Sure, let, let me direct that question to Mr. Ciampa. Uh, uh, would, would that be allowed? Would, would ADUs be allowed to be combined with um, uh, with Article 38 if the main motion passes? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mike Ciampa, Director of Inspectional Services. Uh, a builder would not be able to, to build a duplex in, in this case with two um, accessory dwelling units for sale. Um, it, not being it, it, the accessory dwelling units need to be applied for by the person that's going to live there. Um, and even if that were the case, it would change 
Um, adding accessory dwelling units doesn't change the use by zoning, but it does by building. Uh, so the building code would recognize it as a three or four family, and they would then be required to have uh, fire uh, sprinklers and fire alarm systems. And um, so the, the short of that is no, builders wouldn't be selling these with accessory dwelling units already built in. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And maybe just one last question, um, sure. given Mr. Rodmarker's point around the, the unpredictability of the volume added, I'm curious if there are any studies that were done by planning or any notes um, with a, a range or some guidance for us on, on the potential impact given the housing stock in Arlington and, and recent trends. Okay, uh, well, let me direct that question at uh, Ms. Wright, Director of uh, uh, Planning and Community Development. Has, have there been any studies or any sense of um, what numbers we're talking about here? Jennifer Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, we performed a study of reviewing replacement homes in um, 2019, which was published on the town's website. And in our research, we looked at current rates of demolition and large additions. And between 2010 and 2022, 322 permits were issued in Arlington for substantial residential construction projects in Arlington's low density residential uh, zoning districts. 261 were for demolitions and 61 for major renovations. So on average, there are 27 permit applications uh, filed per year. And we believe that we don't have any uh, sense that that would be any different if this particular article were to pass. So therefore, you might be looking at 27 home per, homes per year um, in terms of those demolitions and replacements. Thank you. Terrific. And with that, is it possible just to circle back to Mr. Rademacher with, if it's 27 homes, that's you know 50 plus units. Uh, does that raise any red flags? Yeah, so Mr. Rademacher, if there were projected, and this is obviously just a, a, a guesstimate, um, uh, if there are 27 homes uh, or uh, 27 single family homes that were split into two family homes or duplexes, uh, can you speak to the load that would have on the town's uh, infrastructure? Sure. I'm Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I, at that rate, I, I would not be concerned about the, um, the strain on the town's utilities. Terrific. That's all for me. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. I see also. Uh, uh, Ms. Friedman has her hand raised, um, uh, so let's take her next. Uh, if you have, if you're undecided, you have questions. Um, Ms. Friedman, uh, Beth Ann, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Uh, Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, I have a question concerning um, the limited size of the unit. From reading it, it refers to heated space, and I'm wondering. Um, what's that um, to preclude a developer from just heating, let's say the first floor and building two additional floors and making essentially two McMansions instead of uh, two reasonably sized structures? Can somebody- um, yeah, Specifically in the context of, are you referring to like to the Newton Amendment about the, the limitation and square footage and heated, uh, heated space? Is that, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that if it's if it's heated space versus total space, I'm not sure if the I think the uh, initial <clears throat> article refers to heated space also. Oh, excuse me. So now I take it back. So with the amendment referring to heated space, I say uh, there's nothing in that that would preclude a if that should um, that amendment should pass in the. Um, <clears throat> article uh, that we're voting on is an amended amended article. Uh, would that preclude developers from just not heating a uh, second floor or first floor and essentially building uh, a couple of McMansions, two McMansions instead like, of one? You're asking, like, like, does it allow for basically partially heated uh, large foot or large home, partially heated homes that, that, that in their entirety uh, exceed these uh, these limitations in square footage. Exactly. Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Zember? 
I, I, I saw Mr. Uh, yeah, Ms. Embry, do you have an answer to that? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I'd actually like to defer to Inspector Champa, but before I do, I'll just note that um, this specifically is both both units within the the entire structure would need to fall within um, all of the requirements that are that are currently in in place, um, and the heated living space refers to the exclusion of attics or basement space um, or building out additional square footage should it exist in an existing home. But I, I'll turn it over to Inspector Champa to give a little bit more color to the um, definition of heated space. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Champa, um, to, to Ms. Friedman's you. question, yeah. uh, if you caught the question about the uh, can someone build beyond those limits and only partially heat the space uh, to conform to these regulations? Yeah, uh, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. So the uh, wording is uh, uh, finished heated living space. And so uh, just by not heating it doesn't, um, doesn't change the fact that it's finished space. If they're finishing a space, um, then it would count into the area they would literally have to leave the rooms unfinished and they would require permits to finish those in the future which they wouldn't be able to do because of the restriction okay so so just one correction to what i said earlier it's, it's not specific i, I apologize it wasn't, it's not specifically the newton amendment that introduces the language around the 1850 square foot limit of heated li uh, living space that that's uh clearly in the in, in the main motion so i apologize for that uh, but i don't see the word finish in the main motion only 18, can we bring that up, the text, so everyone can see what we're referring to? Uh, so the uh, the footnotes added to the tables uh, in the main motion, um, du duplex dwellings shall, uh, let's see, neither unit, uh, yada, 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 shall exceed 1850 square feet of heated living space. Does that, does that change anything, Mr. Trump? Okay. It does not, uh, Mike Chapa, Director of Inspectional Services, it does not, Mr. Moderator, because uh, a heated space, uh, a, a living space has to be finished. So a heated living space is a finished area. Okay, can, can we scroll down here It's uh, in, and show the tables with the with the footnotes beneath them? So we could, cause that's what we're referring to as the footnotes. Yep, that's it. Okay, so, so that's assumed to be living space. So, so if, if right, if a developer built a you know a twenty five hundred square foot space that only eighteen fifty of which was heated, then that would be a problem. Yeah, they, well, they they wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, if it's they they, I know that everyone is afraid of of a go around, but it it just it, they wouldn't be able to do it. The the wording protects it enough. They can't create anything. <clears throat> that could be turned into living space. Um, it, it just because they didn't heat it, they can't. They also can't finish that area because it that it, that would be living space. Finished area is living space. All right. uh, Ms. Friedman, does, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's go back now to the queue. Um, and next person I have. In order is uh, Mr. Lewitton. Name and precinct, please. Hi, Marvin Lewitton, precinct 16. Um, and disclaimer, I live in a two family house in an R1 district that uh, pre predates zoning. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of points that people have raised that, and I'll just, I'll just touch on a few of them. First of all, um, over the last couple of years, I've, I've done a lot of questioning of my neighbors, most of whom live in single family houses, and none of them are remotely concerned by the presence of my house or other two families like it on the street. Um, you know, so, so I think that the idea that we're going to kind of rise people by, by turning Arlington into a community of two families, is, it, it's just clearly not happening. Um, in terms of kind of the, the teardown issue that people are concerned about, it's an unfortunate reality that I don't think a lot of people right now wanna live in small capes 
um, and particularly ones that, that are old enough that they have the lead and asbestos issues that Ms. Babiars mentioned. Um, if you look at the, certainly in, in this neighborhood, if you look at all the capes that have been turned, you know, torn down, they've been replaced by significantly larger houses. Uh, you know, I, I know any number of what looked like really nice houses that were a couple of blocks away from me that, that just aren't there anymore. And, and, you know, much, much larger structures are, are in this place. Um, in terms of sizing, um, you know, the, the state, Department of Planning and Community Development did an analysis on, on you know, what houses were most likely to be torn down. Um, and if you, they, they took a sort of pre-1980, 15 square, 1500 square feet. Um, you know, these, these properties are a tiny percentage of the houses that currently exist in, in the R0 district and, and are maybe 10% of the ones in the R1 district. So, even if every single one of those was, was turned into a two family structure, it's still at a relatively small proportion of the overall houses in the area. Um, so, so I think that it's, um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say, I think that opponents who talk about the end of single family housing in Arlington are exaggerating at best. And, and I think just making statements that are a little bit overblown. Um, in terms of the pricing of, of these properties, yeah, um, it would be nice if two family houses, you know, half of a two family sold for less than they currently do, but it's it's undeniable that half a du you know, that a duplex is going to be significantly less expensive than a single family house that would be twice its size under the under the current zoning you know under the the proposed uh, amendment and and you know so right now if you take the the 30 percent of income figure for a mortgage um you know you're talking about the average single family and house in arlington is going to require somebody to have a household income of four hundred thousand uh, dollars we really loved as as other people have mentioned the income diversity that existed in arlington when we first moved in and and a lot of that is lost I, I'm under, you know, I'm under no kind of, it, it, I don't live in a fantasy world and I know that we're not going to get truly affordable housing out of this article, but the only way to get truly affordable housing is to subsidize it and we have to figure out where that money is going to come from. This will make life more affordable for people and, and just provide more options and, and, and more people that don't have huge incomes and I think that that's, that's worthwhile. Um, in the interest of, of not tying up everybody's time because there are a lot of people on the list. Um, I'll stop now, but I think that Article 38 is, is a great way to actually increase diversity in town to make it more affordable for people that can't afford single family houses, particularly at the prices that they're going for now. And, and I would heartily endorse everybody's you know, positive vote on this. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lewton. Okay, and so let's see. Let's see, let's take, um, so we've had four speakers for so far and three speakers against and two who've uh, just answered or just asked questions. Uh, let's take another uh, speaker against just to, balance, to, to rebalance. Um, let's take uh, Mr. Leone next. He had his hand raised earlier to speak against. Good evening, John Leone, Precinct 8. I'm rising to speak against this article, not for any reason other than I'm just looking at the reality of it. My day job is I do a lot of real estate in town. I represent buyers, I represent sellers, and yes, I do represent contractors. Any single family house that I envision coming on, if we pass this, will get sold to a developer. It will get knocked down and they will build a two family house that is gonna be priced at over a million dollars, easily, each unit. To envision that we are somehow creating affordable housing by this, we're going to increase the ability to diversify our housing stock is pure fantasy. 
I don't see it happening. It, not with the prices that Arlington houses are getting nowadays. This is not the way to create affordable or diversified housing in town. The other reasons that I'm gonna vote against this is strict, strictly looking at the reality of our physical infrastructure. We already have schools that are at capacity. We voted $100,000 earlier this meeting to retrofit the peer school to create more classrooms. If we create even 30, 40 new housing units per year, where are we gonna put those kids? We're gonna to have to either create new schools or reconfigure all of the schools we have. These are not things that we should take lightly with a article that has not been put through um, the normal study process that an ARB article would be put through. And the second, our second thing with the physical structure, 50% or more of our fire calls are for uh, medical help, ambulance, uh, EMS, et cetera. Will the fire department be able to handle an increase of housing of this nature, of this scope in a quick time frame? We may have to increase our um, firefighters. We may need more trucks. These are all expenses that we as a town have to consider before we take a step such as this. We're looking at a override, as Mr. Foskett has told us, within the next five years, potentially $50 million. Can we afford to buy in additional school costs and firefighter and perhaps police force as well? It's gonna create marginally smaller amounts of property tax to be able to pay for these services. I think that if this is a article that we are rushing to take care of, we're gonna increase our density, which we're also already the second densest town in the Commonwealth, and that's towns, and either the 11th or 12th densest municipality in the Commonwealth. Arlington has done its part. I'm not saying that we shouldn't increase our housing stock, but I do not think that this is the way that we should go about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Um, so we've now had four speakers speaking for, four against, uh, two with any questions. Uh, I do wanna allow folks to raise hands again if they, because I wanna make sure we're getting enough questions in um, since we're a little bit lopsided toward for and against. Uh, so if you're interested in, in asking questions, uh, feel free to raise your hands uh, in Zoom. Um, well, uh, Ms. Seuss, uh, who actually happens to be next uh, in the speaking queue. So let's take Ms. Seuss next. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, actually, I wasn't planning on restating comments I'd made in uh, my letter. So it's Jennifer Seuss, Precinct 3. Um, but I do want to ask some questions about the teardowns. Uh, we've heard a lot that there are 27 teardowns on average in town. Um, do we have any sense of how many of those torn down are in the R1, R0 district versus the you know, R2 district or B district or something? Is there any any sense of that? Um, Ms. Zenberry, do you, do you happen to know? Uh, I, Rachel Zenberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. I would like to defer this question to Jennifer Raid, please. Okay, uh, Ms. Raid. Jennifer Raitt, Director of Planning and Community Development. Yes, uh, we do have that information for 2021, 2020, and 2019. Is there a particular year you'd like me to? Oh, um, I, I guess just a, just a sense. So, I mean, we've been talking about 27 small houses being torn down, potentially developed into two family. Is that is that the number if, if, if every family, I mean, aren't some of the houses being torn down in, really in the R2 district right now? I guess just so, a general sense, not 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 year by year. Okay, um, so tw in 2021, last year, 27 of the 55 demolitions were in the R0 and R1 versus the R2. And this particular year we found to be a little bit unusual because there were a number of non-conforming three and four unit structures in the R2 that were demolished and actually replaced by two families and three two families that were demolished and replaced by a two family. Um, okay. The prior year in 2020, just to give you a point of reference, 
six of the 12 homes demolished were in the R0 or R1 versus in the R2 um, and the B district. Okay, so a, a little bit all over the place, but definitely not not all of the, the units. Um, do, do we know if it's only um, builders who are tearing down houses or do sometimes owners tear down houses? Do we have a sense of what that distinction is for the numbers? Ms. Ray? Jennifer Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. Yes, I do. Um, in this past, uh, in 2021 again, uh, there were four of the uh, overall 32 teardowns were by homeowners and the remainder, uh, the balance were by builders. Um, so we do we do have that information, yes. 20%, okay. Um, and then when a house is torn down currently, our current trends, what's usually put into its place? So, so we know, you know, in an R2 district, potentially it's a, a two family, but in the R1 and R0, do we have any sense of how large those houses are? Um, you know, what's generally put up in the place? Ms. Ray? Um, I'll take the first part of the question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the, with the first part of the question, um, in the single family demolitions, which were, you know, there might be a, a total, as I mentioned, of 32 in 2021, and a number of those resulted in two families, um, but not a significant number. There were a total of, um, 13 units added as a result of the 32 single family demolitions. So a total of eight, uh, or I'm sorry, nine two family structures were created as a result of those single family um, teardowns. Oh, no, I was just saying, so in the R1 and R0, when a house is torn down, how big is the unit that's put in its place how, in general? Do we have any trends on that, any, any numbers? We do have numbers on that as well. Mr. Moderator? Yes. Okay, um, so over the decades, we found that at least in the 20, in the, the, not in this most recent decade, but in the 2010s, we found that the median finished area was 3,440 square feet of uh, finished area. Again, living space of the 145 homes that were built over the course of that entire decade. Um, so, and that is bigger than in the 2000s. In that period where 128 homes were built, the median finished area was 2,953 9 square feet. Okay, so the median is over 3,000, which means obviously there's some that are bigger, some are smaller. Do, do we think, have any reason to think that the number is still going up? Is that still our trend or are we sort of holding steady? I believe these numbers reflect where we are today. Um, in terms of the overall, you know, again, on the median, um, you would find about that level of uh, median finished area. Okay, um, I just have one more question. Um, thank you to the meeting. Um, I, I'm no, no longer on the school committee, so I, I have not been studying the numbers as carefully as I used to. Um, could I ask somebody, um, would anybody be able to tell me whether um, the schools can handle an increase of, you know, an extra, 20 houses being built each year or the right, so, and a question about uh, like enrollment um, enrollment yeah yeah, yeah. I mean um, I, I say the numbers very very carefully a couple of years ago but I haven't been looking at them as carefully recently yeah do we have miss uh Ms Exton with us uh, the uh, chair of the school committee could potentially answer that uh do we have uh Ms. Exton, Elizabeth Exton in uh, among town meeting members. Um, I doubt we have the superintendent okay. with us tonight and it, it, um, we're not finding Ms. Exton and the attendees at the moment. Um, okay, that, that's it for my questions. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you for the patience of the, of the meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Seuss. So we've had, um, let's see, uh, there's been questions in the Q and A about like, well, are, are we going to have a straw poll at some point to terminate debate? Like, when's that going to happen? Obviously, we're, we're way way past 15 minutes, but there's also a lot of folks who want to speak. Uh, and so, when we get to uh, uh, at least five folks who've spoken, like five for, five against, and five uh, with questions, when we get to that point. Uh, I'll, I'll consider doing a straw poll, um, and we'll we'll take it from there. Um, uh, let's see. So, so far we've had four speaking for, four against, and three with questions. 
Uh, I'm going to take, um, let, let me take two more from the queue since they might fit into one of these categories. Uh, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. So let's take uh, Dr. Warden next. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Please go ahead. Name and precinct, please. Yes. Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. First, Article 38 is the most discriminatory article Arlington has ever considered. Um, the Article 38 units are affordable only by those earning more than 200% of area median income. They completely exclude the families of medium or limited means of all races and color. The most racist we could get rid of that, echo. that I have ever seen. Um, it will ruin Arlington's um, excellent um, record as uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion by creating housing only for the rich. Um, so in all the decades I have been in Arlington, Article 38 is just about the worst. Um, this is the most fundamental change in our zoning in our town. Um, it, it is a change to the districts which are fundamental to all zoning patterns. When we used to have a newspaper that most everyone bought, there would have been a banner headline saying, quote, Arlington Redevelopment Board proposes an end of single family zoning. So people would know what was possibly about to happen and could take action. But now what passes for a newspaper does not report our election, does not report town meeting, and no, if people even see the warrant that is buried in a bunch of advertising flyers that probably go right into the recycling, they are unlikely to read it or see what is being proposed. And real people do not check out the town's website every few minutes. People um, don't know what could happen in their neighborhoods. Such fundamental change should not happen without substantial buy-in by a majority of the population. Um, and the robocalls calls from the town regarding snow and whatnot, um, but they didn't bother to inform anyone about the possible end of single family zoning. Arlington has done its share and more to deal with the so-called housing crisis. We are already the second densest town in the state and the 12th densest community. We have less commercial and industrial tax base than just about any, any place else. No other community in Massachusetts has taken such a dramatic step as abolishing single family zoning. If the comments made about Lexington, my daughter owns a house there and this will be news to her if they're considering anything remotely like this, which is unlikely because one of their planners is very strongly pro affordable housing. If this is a contest, for the worst ideas, it's one we do not want to win. So please vote no on the article, which I do have a few more comments to make. Um, I would like to say that it will cause our entire town to become a great big unpleasant demolition construction site with developers and their dependent architects, lawyers and politicians deriving vast profits with buy right development of huge four unit and two family luxury homes only for the wealthy 
and in every residential district. These homes will be for maximum profits and not required to be energy efficient and net zero, not required to prevent them towering over a butting place and blocking the sun from neighboring homes and solar panels with the large shadows, not required to provide any affordable units, not required to avoid clear cutting of trees, since for developers, the fines are negligible compared to their profits, not required to address rising infrastructure costs cost of new schools and not required to address increased parking demand, not required to address the loss of embodied energy and materials in the teardowns. There is nothing about Article 38 units that will benefit the townspeople except for those of our leaders who are members of Metropolitan Area Planning Council or for density advocates for whom this sad article would be a major policy victory. It's relevant that Arlington is the most dense town in Massachusetts. After studying nearby municipalities, if half a dozen or so of the surrounding communities were required to reach Arlington's density, there would be no shortage of available homes in our region. And to Arlington's great benefit, Arlington would then cease to be the object of its leaders' relentless drive to maximize density. They could instead focus on retraining, retaining and increasing business commercial interests and the benefits to the community regarding avoidance of crowding and safeguards for the environment, which are the responsibility of the Arlington Redevelopment Board and are spelled out in section 1.2 of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. Please vote no on Article 38. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warden. Um, let's uh, let's take uh, Ms. Thornton next. Ms. Speaking. Kit. Uh, Ms. Thornton, are you able to unmute? Uh, do we have a, a number perhaps that uh, Ms. Thornton can dial into when we had this issue last week? Okay, it's posted in the public chat. Uh, Ms. Thornton, are you able to dial in to the Zoom call? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. I, I will make this shorter. Uh, this is Barbara Thornton, Precinct 16, and I am happy to uh, speak in favor of this Article 38. Uh, first of all, this article is not going to eliminate six single family homes in Arlington. Now, single family zoning controls over 75% of the town's residential zones. Given the history of exclusion and segregation behind the concept of zoning, it seems reasonable to allow in more two families homes that would be scattered throughout the town rather than in one district. 
uh, East Arlington. A recent piece from the Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies argues that eliminating single family zoning will enable a slow process of multifamily housing development, not large scale neighborhood change. The Joint Center has published multiple recent pieces uh, for by right family zoning. I, I want to raise that because I have often heard that we're not providing enough data. Um, this article that we're that is being proposed tonight is not to provide affordable housing. The uh, Arlington Housing Trust Fund, I'm very excited to, to anticipate what they're going to do to provide affordable housing. Uh, the, we have the uh, Housing Corporation of Arlington and we have the Arlington Housing Authority that can provide affordable housing. As uh, Marvin Lewitton said earlier, affordable housing costs money uh, to, to subsidize and we don't yet have that money. But hopefully uh, this bill will provide homes for households that make less than $400,000 per year. $400,000 is significant because that's about what it costs to buy a home that's coming on, a single family home that's coming to market right now. We would like to lower that with this article and allow people who are making between 70, uh, 150,000 and 200,000 to be able to buy a home in Arlington. Uh, using the general mortgage assumptions of 20% down, 5% uh, over 30 year mortgage and a monthly payment of 30% of gross income, a $200,000 a year income could buy a home for a million dollars and $150,000 a year income could buy a home for $750,000. Now that's the target and I agree with people, these are, these are these duplexes are not going to be cheap, but that's the target range that I think they're likely to fall in for new homes that are energy uh, efficient and, uh, and up to uh, current uh, sustainability standards. And what will it, this do is will allow these people to purchase a smaller home in Arlington and to buy a home here. It's a 21st century starter home that given its restricted size will remain a starter home for decades into the future. I hope that uh, the town, my fellow town meeting members will vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Uh, let's take uh, a couple of speakers next uh, who raised their hands earlier with questions. Uh, let's see if they still have questions. I believe uh, uh, Ms. Weber had her hand raised earlier, I believe, uh, to, um, to ask questions. I didn't have a question. I wanted to speak, so I'll wait for my turn. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tosti, did you have your hand raised earlier uh, to ask questions on Article 38? Let's bring up Mr. Tosti. Name and precinct, please. Alan Tosti, Precinct 17. Uh, my questions are really pretty straightforward. Uh, Mr. Moderator, what is the vote required to pass Article 38? The, uh, the quantum of vote is a two thirds vote. And okay. the, yeah, go ahead. It needs a two thirds vote to pass. Uh, I'll double check that. I believe that's the case. Um, yes, two thirds vote, correct. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and just to add a little bit of color to that, uh, the, uh, like the, uh, a majority vote on zoning bylaw changes applies to multifamily housing, which is three or more family housing, uh, which does not apply in this case because it would be turning them into two family homes or duplexes. Uh, so it remains at the default for zoning bylaw amendments, which is a two thirds vote. Um, um, we'll take uh, one more uh, person who had their hand raised, I believe, to ask questions. Uh, 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 Ms. Pagliastati. Can we bring up Ms. Pagliastati uh, if she had questions uh, for Article 38? Okay. Um, 
is she not in this? She was in the queue before there. Yeah. Name and precinct, please. Jan Palasotti, precinct eight. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Did, did you have questions on this article that you wanted to ask? Yes. Um, okay. Yes. My question is: Is there a way? Is there any mechanism that this kind of issue of addressing equity around um, equity concerns around single family housing? Is there any way that it can be addressed at a more of a regional area, or does it have to be? only the town of Arlington, uh, because my concern is, you know, is there a way to avoid having Arlington be the target for developers? By passing this, uh, the main motion? Yes, yes. Is there a way to have more of a regional approach to addressing this rather than just the town of Arlington? Um, well, it's really outside the scope, I think, of this argument. This, the, the article is clearly scoped to what Arlington can do in this regard. Um, are you asking like other more effective means? Um, that would be regional, but, but it's not again. Really, that's not really in the scope of of this article. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll take. Uh, can we? Uh, uh, since we, we didn't actually have a, a question really answered there, let's take another question. Um, uh, can we enable raise hands for folks who have questions? Um, folks who are already in the speaking queue uh, who have questions. Um, uh, try to put someone near the top. Um, uh, I see Ms. Kelleher is I think closest to the top. Uh, let's take Ms. Kelleher next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, name and precinct, please. Karen Kelleher, precinct five. I think some of my questions have been answered, but um, but some haven't. And so I thank you for the opportunity to ask them. Um, one of the prior speakers spoke about the specter of waking up to a 5,500 square foot um, building next door. And I just wanted to ask for a clarification on that. I think it was answered by a subsequent question, but um, I, I think that article 38 wouldn't allow that, but I wanted to ask if that was the case. I think Mr. Rademacher answered that question. Uh, Mr. Rademacher, did you answer that question already? Not, not that one specifically, but in, in his uh, response about ADUs. Oh, they wouldn't be able to do ADUs and? Can you clarify the question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm glad to. Um, I think that there's a limit of each unit to being 1,850 square feet, which would add up to something like 1,700 square feet, uh, 2,700 square feet total. And so I don't know how a 5,500 square foot building is possible in light of Mr. Rademacher's answer on the ADUs. And I just wanted to confirm that that is in fact correct, that that 5,000 square foot building is not possible. Yeah, I, th I think that might have been directed to uh, Mr. Champa, Mr. Ch uh, Director of uh, Inspectional Services. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mike Champa, yeah. Director yeah. of Inspectional Services. Yeah. Uh, that's correct. They would not be able to build a 5,500 square foot home uh, using this regulation. They would be uh, limited to the, the 3,700 square feet. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure who this should be directed at, but maybe it's um, Ms. Ray. Does 38 change the dimensional requirements on any lot in any zone in Arlington? Does it uh, allow a larger or, or change any other uh, sort of requirements about how big a building you can build on a lot? Can you build like a, if, with, with Article 38, are you asking? Can you build a, a, a larger kind of floor area or footprint uh, home? Does it change and... any of those things at all? Um... Okay. Ms. Wright? Jennifer Wright, Director of Planning and Community Development. No, this would not change any dimensional requirements or open space requirements or parking requirements or anything uh, related to density requirements either. This uh, would be exactly the same. Um, the only thing being considered is a use change. Thank you. So 
it can't change the size of the building, um, how high it is, what the setbacks are, any of those things that might affect the massing on the, on the site. It doesn't make a larger McMansion possible. In fact, a McMansion is still possible. There's just one more thing possible, which is that there could be two families in that building instead of one. Is that correct? Uh, that's my, uh, Ms. Rate, is, is, is that a fair uh, assessment? That is correct. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and does it in any way relax any energy efficiency requirements, any green space requirements, any sustainability requirements that are already in place? Does this article change those in any way? For, 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 the, for the total building? For the total building, does the, does if we yeah. enact Article 38 for any lot in town, are we reducing our sustainability requirements that we otherwise impose? Or will they still be there exactly the same way they were? Uh, Ms. Wright? This does not, not alter any of the other requirements of the zoning bylaw that are already in place, including um, the some of the uh, points that you mentioned um, about um, sustainability, or if uh, somebody wanted to create an energy efficient home. Um, and it also does not alter the town bylaw requirements regarding tree preservation. So that mm -hmm. it all remains the same and would need to be compliant with such. I appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you. And then, um, you know, we previously someone asked Ms. Zembury to speak to, um, a, as a ARB member who voted against this article, to speak to her reasoning. And I, I wondered if we could ask if the ARB members who, she suggested there was a fair amount of consensus among the ARB about this direction, but some, some members were comfortable moving forward at this point. And I wonder if we could ask if the um, current zoning board, uh, ARB members who voted in favor of this might wish to speak to their yes votes. Uh, I don't know if we have those folks present. Uh, I'm not aware. I mean, I, I didn't ask for, for members of the ARB other than obviously the chair, Ms. Zembury, uh, to be present at the meeting. Um, uh, so I, I'm not sure if they're available to speak. Um, uh, but perhaps Ms. Zembury, maybe you could speak to the rationale behind the, I believe it's three uh, of the five members who voted in favor. Uh, Ms. Zembury, can, can you speak to, to that? Yeah. You? Yes, Rachel Zembury, um, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. There are two members of the Redo Redevelopment Board who voted in favor of this article who are town meeting members uh, here with us this evening, Steve Revelak and Jean Benson. Um, so if the moderator um, would, would allow them to speak, I'm sure that they would be happy to do so. Sure. So we have about a minute and 15 seconds left on Ms. Kelleher's time. Uh, can we bring up uh, uh, Mr. Revelak? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelak, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, yeah, I voted in. F I voted in favor of this mainly for two reasons. One, I think it is a, it is a good policy, and based on what we have seen um, over the, the last few years and the tear the home replacements we've studied over the last ten years, I think it's fairly re easy to reason. It's fairly straightforward to reason ab about the impacts. Um, you know, I I you know, believe this would be a, you know, a fairly gradual change, you know, as, as, as stated earlier, we're, there are only about 27 demolitions per year. And, um, you know, the other part of the reason for voting yes is I felt that, that uh, this issue has come before the ARB before, and I thought it was time to um, give town, town meeting an opportunity to weigh in. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Keller, 10 seconds left. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I see the points uh, made in the Q and A about uh, the, the the nature of these questions. Uh, obviously, the questions uh, uh, in uh, from the previous speaker um, uh, do paint a particular picture in a particular direction. Um, and so uh, I, I will I'll allow one more speaker against to kind of balance the airtime. And uh, and so next on my list, I have. Uh, Mr. Wagner, uh, who uh, had raised his hand earlier to speak against. Uh, uh, Mr. Wagner. Thank you. Before starting my time, could you please bring up the short slide deck that I submitted to the town? Can we bring that up, please? Yeah. 
if you could please reset my time also to the point where the uh, the slide comes up. Thank you. I'm Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. I ask you to vote no on Article 38. The reason to vote no is that the article would make us more expensive than if we vote yes. Uh, if we vote no, excuse me. Despite its stated goal, it would make us less diverse in our housing stock and in the people who can live here. It would result in drastic reduction of our open spaces, our climate resiliency, and our trees. Especially in a housing crisis, this is the wrong thing to do. Next slide, please. Thank you. A group of, of pro-density articles were proposed for town meeting in 2019, including proposals that would let balconies and roofs be called open green space. And after many members spoke against the density articles, the redevelopment board, the ARB, changed its vote to no action and pledged that the public should be better aware and more involved in major zoning and density changes. In 2020, at the special town meeting, the proponents of an article very similar to Article 38, which included Mr. Revelak, pledged that their goal was to improve affordability, diversity, and our environment, but they were unable to demonstrate this. As a result, the ARB did not support the article at that time. Now in 2022, the ARB supported the motion for a stated goal of housing choice. But this housing choice is a misleading title, as it would actually remove housing choice from many of us. It would remove lower priced homes while adding only much higher priced units. And it would eliminate choice for lower income renters and buyers. Next slide, please. Arlington today has some of the most inclusive zoning laws in the entire state. Our lot sizes are small, we're walkable and close to good transit, and we have a wide mix of multifamily, two family and single family homes. Single family zoned homes, I don't know where the 70% number came from, we've checked it, are just 39% of our town. Arlington is actually cheaper to live in or rent in than all the communities that border us, except one Medford. One of the great things about us is this mix, housing diversity that supports different types of renters and owners. For example, when I moved here, we lived in the two family zoning, and then 10 years later, we were able to stay in the town by moving to a single family zone. Our daughter could stay in the school system. My wife and I could con continue to have the great transit and walkability that our town offers. Next slide, please. If article 38 goes through, Many of these inclusive good things that I just described would quickly disappear in Arlington via acceleration of teardowns and acceleration of housing cost increases. This is a table of all the recent sales of single family homes that then turned into two families in Arlington with some recent two family condo sales from the R2 districts also shown. The numbers are small, I'm sorry, but the stark, stark takeaway here is that in every case, every case, when a single family is torn down in Arlington, the price of the two new units that replace it each individually exceed the home demolished and usually by a lot. If Article 38 passes, the affordability of our town will not just be hurt because the new condos cost so much more than the single units. In addition, the property taxes in the immediate area of the new condos usually go up, which puts stress on people in fixed incomes like the elderly, and it pushes displacement of our neighbors. And there's the fact that the least expensive houses are the very ones bought up by the developers to be turned into the new condos. So it would remove the least expensive units while adding high priced units. Also, the additional density threatens to cause increased costs of services like our schools, roads and our infrastructure. And these will need to be expanded or rebuilt to help the higher load of, of people, traffic, students. The quality of these services could also suffer even as we'd be paying more for them. Next slide, please. Here's a typical before and after photo. The new units will typically max out at the size of the structures that are allowed with awkward compromises, as you can see, on parking and uh, also permeable green open space and trees lost. Although we, have a, we do have a tree law to protect us against the loss of trees, it really requires the developer to just pay a fine to the town. Even if it's a fine like the $23,000 at a recent Lancaster Road teardown, the developer will just pay it and remove the trees. The law is a cost, simply. The tree canopy and open space will disappear. Think about the waste of teardowns. Town meeting has seen a lot of good proposals to try to prevent them, but this one goes the other way, to encourage teardowns. Research has shown that it's better to renovate and to insulate our classic and older structures rather than to tear them down. 
losing all that embodied energy as wasteful rubbish. Next slide, please. I'll try to be quicker. Here's another Arlington image of what can happen. Next slide, please. We're in a housing crisis, meaning housing costs are going up. As the chart demonstrated earlier, if Article 38 passes, there would be dramatic price increases in 39% of our town. This is absolutely the wrong response to the housing crisis now. Instead, if the rest of the town manager 12 towns that we compare ourselves to added new housing to come up to near our current level of density, the Metro Boston housing shortage would actually be solved. The housing choice promoted by the article is really for high, higher home prices than what we have now, and it would remove the choice of middle and lower priced homes and for those buyers and renters. Even though a stated goal is more housing diversity in Article 38, it would actually reduce housing choice for the middle set of owners and renters, and it would go further to exclude most lower income residents. The effect is reduced diversity. There's well, another fairness just, problem. FYI, we are at the six minute mark, you have one minute. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm almost done. There's another fairness problem. Thousands of Arlington residents made the decision to live where they are now. Of residents who did actually find out about this article and contacted me, nearly every voice, every email says, do not support Article 38. Do not support the amendments. This goes against that 2019 pledge made by the ARB to better involve the public and to get their support on major, major zoning changes. And there are a lot of amendments. I ask you to vote no on all the amendments to Article 38 because they will still promote two family units in the single family zones. And they would still cause the core problems of making us more expensive, less diverse and, open, and hurting our open spaces. With any amendments, the article will still unfairly article the, or, or alter the zoning for thousands of people. Even with the living space limitation amendments, there could be two family structures with ADUs, enormous on our standard 6,000 foot lots, with cars somehow cited legally or else for four units. Please vote no on Article 38 and the amendments that come with it to end single family zoning. It'll worsen our town. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, so uh, we've now had at least five speakers each for questions, for speaking in favor and speaking against. Um, uh, I do at this point uh, want to uh, do a straw poll for uh, whether there's interest in terminating debate. So let's enable hand raise, uh, uh, raised hands in Zoom. And if you are uh, interested, again, this is a straw poll. Um, uh, if you are interested in terminating debate, please raise your hand. Uh, I've identified uh, 200 and let's say, there's two thirties. So make sure I have the right denominator. Uh, 231 members uh, in attendance. Uh, if we reach the 75% threshold that I had set earlier in the 15 minute rule, which has been uh, kind of lengthened here to allow significantly more debate, um, um, we would need 173 or actually 174 uh, raised hands to, uh, to trigger um, selection of someone who wishes to terminate debate um, next. Um, and while we're waiting there, we do have a couple of points of order. Let's take, I think you know, these are new. Let's take uh, Ms. Weber first as a point of order. Janice Weaver, Precinct 21, um, I moved to, to dissolve the meeting tonight. Uh, I'm not going to uh, 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 take any uh, motions from a uh, point of order, uh, which I did at that one meeting, but not gonna, uh, not gonna make that same mistake again. Um, thank you. Um, let's take uh, Ms. Babiars next, point of order. Uh, yes, Mr. Moderator, it's just a, a question. Were we to vote um, on a collective bargaining agreement <clears throat> at this meeting? Um, uh, we were, and I checked in with Mr. Foskett, and it's okay if we just kind of uh, push that to uh, Monday's meeting instead. Thank you. So we can make as much progress as possible on uh, Article 38 tonight. Um, and okay, so looking at the, what we have as far as raised hands, uh, we have 128 raised hands out of 231 members, which comes out at uh, about 55%. Again, this is a straw poll, it's not exact. and 
folks might be having trouble finding raised hands uh, in Zoom. Um, you know, so it, it's not an official count, but it's to get a temperature check. So just a signal uh, to town meeting members that 55%, uh, actually it's up to 132 now, 57% um, of town meeting members have affirmatively raised their hands uh, to indicate interest in terminating debate. Um, and uh, so that's not gonna, so that's not going to trigger me to select someone out of order just to terminate debate. But if someone is inclined to do that from the speaking queue as we go through in the natural order, then then they are, they are free to do so. Um, uh, let's see. The points of order have been cleared, so we are now at uh, ten fifty five. So let, let's uh, take another speaker from the queue, and so we'll take uh, Mr. Blandy next, who's in the number one position. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, please. Okay, Charles Blandy, Precinct 6. Uh, I move the question in all matters before it. Okay, so we have a motion to uh, terminate debate. Do we have any seconds? We have a second from Mr. Hamlin. So let's bring up a vote on terminating debate on uh, Article 38 and all matters before it. Okay, so we're opening voting on whether to terminate debate on Article 38 and the two amendments before it. So if you are in favor of terminating debate, vote yes. If you wanna continue debate, vote no. And uh, while folks are voting, I'll uh, answer. There was a question in the Q and A. Why would we? Uh, it's a very logical, rational question. Why would we uh, have a threshold of seventy-five percent uh, for uh, ultimately for a motion that only requires two-thirds, uh, as uh, termination of debate requires only a two-thirds vote? So why have a straw poll for seventy-five percent? Um, and so uh, this is basically uh, the the original fifteen-minute rule that I had introduced and uh, allowing some latitude tonight because there was a lot of interest in hearing a diversity of speakers. And uh, as far as the 75% threshold that was chosen, um, uh, because I don't want to exercise too heavy a hand in terminating debate uh, or to pressure folks into terminating debate if that's not what the meeting wants to do. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I could have said it lower, but uh, you know, this is a first step to try this out uh, to see how it works in practice. And um, this may be adjusted uh, in the future. Okay, so we have over 200 votes in. Uh, vote yes if you want to terminate debate. Vote no if you want to continue debate. Um, and 208 votes in. Uh, it's only about 16 vote, uh, uh, active voters in the portal who have not voted yet. So let's just give another uh, 15 seconds until we close voting on termination of debate of Article 38 and all matters before it. Uh, 10 seconds until we close voting. Five seconds, get your votes in. And let's close voting on termination of debate. And the motion passes with 76%. Uh, 165 in the affirmative, 51 in the negative. Uh, so let's go ahead. We are getting close to 11 o'clock, but let's uh, try to get these votes in um, uh, before we adjourn. Um, it would be nice to be able to complete this article in one evening. Um, and so uh, we're going to take the Newton Amendment first. And so we'll enable voting. And let's bring up the text of that after voting opens. Okay, so if you are in favor of Mr. Newton's amendment, which you can see listed here with the added text uh, uh, underlined, vote yes. If um, And voting yes would uh, amend the main motion with these changes. If you're against the Newton Amendment that you're seeing here, then you can vote no.
And so this is basically adding the, uh, the like effectively adding the phrase like for, for three years following the date of the initial sort of a certificate of occupancy, occupancy for such dwelling and adding that text for both of the uh, footnotes. Uh, and so if you want to add that, uh, that extra language about the three years following the date of the initial certificate of occupancy, uh, vote yes. If you wanna leave that out, vote no. Okay, we're just over 200 votes cast now. And all the, the amendments are always a majority vote, even though in this case, the main motion is a two thirds vote. Okay, we're at 220 votes in, so let's just wait another uh, 30 seconds before we close voting. 20 seconds. Ten seconds until we close voting on the Newton Amendment. Five seconds. Okay, let's close voting. And remember, this is a majority vote. And the Newton Amendment fails. Uh, 101 in the affirmative, 116 in the negative. We'll wait for these uh, the voting screens. And then next, we'll vote on the Babiar's Amendment. Um, procedurally, uh, the Newton Amendment failing makes it simpler to deal with the Babiar's Amendment, because otherwise uh, there would be a conflict that we'd have to resolve. Um, so just wait for the voting screens here, and then we'll take up the uh, a, a vote on the Babiar's Amendment uh, immediately afterward. Okay, let's um, let's open voting now on the Babiar's amendment. Okay, so voting is opening by waves. Uh, can we please bring up the, the text of the Babiar's Amendment so everyone can see what we're voting on? If they don't already have it open in the, this is all available in the annotated warrant, but just so you have it all in one place. Okay, and can we scroll down so we can see the change in context? All right, so it's adding the two family and duplex dwelling uses with deed restrictions shall be allowed as of December 1st, 2023. So it's basically pushing back the effective date of when two family dwellings and du duplex dwellings are allowed in R0 and R1. So they will not be allowed before December, 2023. Um, so if you're in favor of making this change to push back the effective date of the change in definition of R0 and R1 to allow uh, two family and um, duplex or, or duplex dwellings uh, vote yes for this amendment. Uh, if you're not in favor of pushing that back to December 2023, vote no. And again, this is just the amendment to the main motion. And this is a majority vote to change the main motion. Okay, we have 213 votes in, 216. Um, okay, we have only about 12 active members who in the portal who haven't voted yet. So let's just give, uh, we'll give uh, 30 seconds. Twenty seconds until we close voting on the Babiar's amendment. Ten seconds until we close voting. Five seconds. 
Okay, let's close voting on the Babiar's amendment. Remember, this is a majority vote to amend the main motion. And the motion fails. Uh, 29 in the affirmative, 194 in the negative. Uh, so wait for these screens to cycle through. And then after that, we will take up a vote on the main motion of Article 38, unamended. Okay, let's open up voting now on the main motion for Article 38. And this is a two thirds vote. Okay, okay voting should be opening depending on which, which wave you're in. If you're seeing a message about your connection will be retried after a short delay, just sit tight. And Okay, voting should be opening up for everyone. Okay, so we're now voting on the main motion of Article 38. Uh, while we're waiting for the votes to come in, can we... Uh, just bring up the text of the, the vote language for article for the main motion. So this changes the definitions of the R0 and R1 districts to uh, no longer be limited to single family, um, allowing for two family and duplex dwellings and changing some footnotes uh, to that same effect. So if you're in favor of uh, allowing two family dwellings uh, or duplex dwellings in the R0 and R1 districts, you can vote yes. If you're opposed to that change in the zoning bylaw, you can vote no. We have 218 votes in. We only have about uh, 13 members who have been recently active in the portal we're still waiting for. So let's just give another uh, 30 seconds to get those votes in. Twenty seconds until we close voting. 15 seconds, 10 seconds. Oh, wait, um, being instructed, we do have votes coming in by phone. So I, I will wait a little bit longer to make sure we can get those, uh, those in-flight votes uh, to actually land.
Okay, so uh, Ms. Brazil, I'm just waiting for the signal that you're done taking uh, votes that are that were in flight. Okay, we have uh, yeah, some votes or folks asking for confirmation of votes in the Q&A, so let's just make sure we have those. Okay. Okay, let me just give another 10 seconds um, and then we'll close voting. It looks like everything that was in flight uh, has gotten, gotten through. Five seconds and then we're gonna close voting. Okay, let's close voting on Article 38, main motion. Okay, and this is a two-thirds vote, and the motion fails. 49.8% um, of the vote um, is short of a two-thirds threshold, so it fails. We'll wait for the screen, the voting screens to, to cycle through all the precincts, 112 in the affirmative, 113 in the negative. Uh, so the main motion for Article 38 fails. And as while we're waiting for, so that, that closes Article 38. Uh, we'll just wait for the screens to go by. While we're, while we're waiting for the screens, um, and before I recognize uh, a motion to adjourn, uh, let's enable raised hands in Zoom one more time. And please raise your hand in Zoom if you have any notices of reconsideration uh, for any of the votes that we took tonight. If you, uh, this requires that you voted on the prevailing side uh, and wish to reserve the right to reconsider a vote at a later time before the annual town meeting is eventually dissolved. Um, so if you'd like to give notice of reconsideration, now is your chance. Um, uh, so we have a raised hand from, um, it disappeared. So Mr. Warden's hand and it disappeared. Um, so I get folks, okay, uh, Mr. Warden, uh, can we bring up Mr. Warden um, so he can give his notice of reconsideration? Uh, Mr. Warden, are you able to unmute? I, I, yes. Yes. I, I, I yes. can hear. I, I can hear can you. you hear me? Yes. Yes, Mr. Can. Mr. Moderator, John Warden, yes. Precinct Eight. Having voted on the prevailing side, I I give a notice of a reconsideration. On which? On Article Thirty Eight. Uh, Article Thirty Eight. Great. Thank you. Any other notices of reconsideration for tonight? The moderator. Yes, Mr. Foskett. I move we adjourn. Okay, do we have a we have a motion from Mr. Foskett to adjourn? Do we have a second? Second. A second from Ms. Ms. Brazil. Let's uh, keep raised hands enabled in Zoom. Uh, any objections to adjourning? We're now at 11, 12 p.m. Um, if you have objections to adjourning and you wanna just keep doing this all night, you can raise your hands. Um, seeing none, I declare that a unanimous vote and uh, we are adjourned until, uh, until Monday. See everyone. Um, uh, Monday night. Have a good night, everybody.